started slowly here, just uh, introducing the MC before we hit the clock, so that we hit the clock with the first presentation. So my name is Kareem Yagmore. Welcome to the Android Micro Conference. This is about the seventh or eighth year it runs. Um, first time we ran it, we had two people from Google. This year, you know, the, every year it keeps increasing, so we're very happy about that. Um, it has become a primary rendezvous point between um, the Android team and the uh, general Linux community at large. Um, not that there aren't conversations ongoing over the year, but this one has become kind of like a nice uh, way to sync everything, everybody together. So on behalf of the organization committee, that's uh, Todd uh, Amit, uh, who is not here, and myself, I'd like to welcome you um, to this afternoon, which will probably overflow to sometime around seven-ish, depending on how things go. You do have, uh, every presenter has 15 minutes, and this is a hard limit. If you were there last year, you saw how it went. Effectively, by 15, I'll just cut you off, and you'll have to you know, pursue it outside or whatever. Preferably, you're doing five minutes of presentation and 10 minutes of talking. I'll leave you the liberty to continue between the five and 10 minute mark, but about the 10 minute mark, if you haven't actually started the discussion, I'm gonna force it upon you. <laughs> All right, I'll, depending on the situation, I might be a bit flexible on this, but seriously, I mean, if you're getting close to 10 minutes, you, you, you really wanna get started on the conversation because that's the point of these, of these, uh, these micro-conferences, to actually engage um, with the audience. There is going to be an etherpad. Um, Alicia is going to start uh, doing that. If uh, anybody else wants to chime in and add stuff along the way, that's uh, perfectly fine. Um, what else do I want to say here? Um, right, there is some homework for you to do if you're presenting. So you get your 15 minutes of fame. Um, afterwards, however, uh, depending on the discussion, you do want to take the time to actually fill in the progress report. Um, and effectively, it's not a very difficult format. There's, you know, uh, wins, work, losses. The idea there is just to summarize what progress has been made, what people have agreed upon, what they disagreed about, and what things people agree on disagreeing, um, unless there's some future work to be done about it, all right? The rules for the mics, um, there's two cubes. I was told that you want to hold them around this, not too close to your mouth, not too far away. You don't want to bring them together. It's like the Ghostbuster rules, uh, okay? Don't mix the streams. Uh, don't cross the streams, I think the, the, the actual quote is. Um, what else do I want to say? Okay, yeah, the video's cut off at 6.30, so we are going to lose one or two sessions or whatever discussion that goes afterwards. I don't think it's that big of a deal. And we are going to um, probably close around 7-ish, depending on where things go. Anything else? Any questions? Todd, did I forget anything? We're good? Okay. Sorry, yes. Yeah, please stand where you, th th yes, thank you for reminding me about that. If you are holding the cube and you need to talk, please stand so the person filming can actually film you and know you who, uh, who is talking. As well, if you're talking to, uh, if you're explaining something on the screen, you wanna put position yourself this way so the camera can also catch that as well. All right, and with that, th Sandeep, it's all yours. So, yeah, so I, if you just wanna switch his presentation in, or is it just, yep, thanks. Definitely, I checked again, just to make oh, sure. Oh, yeah, one last thing, sorry. Yeah, uh, one last thing before we get started. Uh, the, the schedule is such that there are 15 minutes slots, so even if you finish before, we'll wait for the next 15 mark to start the next presentation. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Sandeep Patil. I lead an uh, Android kernel team in Google. We talked about what we are trying to do with uh, Android kernels in last year's plumbers around uh, generic <coughs> kernel images. Uh, we maintain an Android common kernel, which basically is essentially an upstream for uh, the new Android devices. Uh, but none of this kernel, this kernel actually runs on any given Android device because of how downstream gets heavily modified. So our goal is to refactor our kernel enough and give AP APIs for modules enough uh, and test it enough in order to make sure it actually runs on the devices and boots and then we can run tests with it. There are a lot more details about it in the LWN article that I linked. Uh, the TLDR from last year's thing was basically all of this helps us 
uh, a or b as close to as po as close to the main line as possible today we don't know what it takes in order to run an android device uh, well, what it takes to be added in the kernel in order to run on Android device. We know what it takes to run Android, but not necessarily on any given hardware. So our goal is to basically find all of that out and then upstream it and try and be as close to mainline as possible. This has been, so we started off about, uh, right after last year's plumbers. So target, for example, the, tar the kernels that we are targeting this time is we have an, uh, AOSP Android mainline branch, which is basically tracking upstream Linux. And we also have a 419 LTS branch. The mainline branch will essentially probably fork into when there is a next long-term stable. We also have decided on the first hardware target, uh, one being uh, Cuttlefish, which we talked about last year as well. This is basically uh, the Android virtual device, has both x86 and ARM64. The x86 one is obviously a lot easier, so that will get enabled first sometime this month, I think. Alistair, correct, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. Uh, and by that, I, what, what I mean by that is it'll actually have a generic kernel, def config, just like what we were talking about in the distribution microconference yesterday. It'll have its own def config. It'll have all the drivers that it needs in order to run Cuttlefish, and then we'll, that'll be our first litmus test. Then we'll move on to the ARM64 uh, Cuttlefish. Again, it'll be easier because there's no uh, all the drivers in the Cuttlefish world are some are everything that was that is known to us. So that's our next. And then we have a bunch of AOSP development boards, whether it's DB845 and Hikey. That work is already ongoing, and so we expect that to happen next, followed by actual phones and devices. Uh, right. So where are we working on all of this? Basically, the branches are Android 4.19.5.4. Uh, we are using a single configuration. We named it GKI def config, and it's basically for ARM64. There's one for x86 as well. Uh, we are using a single tool chain, uh, Clang, and we are almost, herm we, are, we have, the herm I, I, ha I had an asterisk at Hermetic build, but we are basically trying to make sure all our kernel builds are reproducible as well. But uh, as far as the tooling is concerned, it's mostly within that repo package. Uh, and the scope is obviously we want to make sure this kernel runs on ARM64 and x86. I'm going to move to the important parts. This is basically how we divided all the work. We have ABI monitoring. We need this obviously in order to make sure the device drivers and modules continue to work as we keep making <coughs> kernel changes. And we want to make sure how we are changing it over LTS or over our own changes. How do we choose kernel configurations that need to be enabled? We are basically working with everybody. So we are actually enabling a lot of things pretty much every single day into this based on the needs and what gets enabled on devices. Uh, we also have to solve interdependencies between devices and device drivers because this is something that we saw was didn't quite actually work like what we expected in upstream as well. So there are discussions going on in the mailing list and I'll talk more about it later. We also have to make sure, uh, we have been in the bad habit of keep breaking user space every year pretty much with Android Common Call. Uh, we decided we're not going to do that anymore thank from when we do GKI. So, but before, so before we sign up to do that, we want to make sure all the user space facing things are finalized and the way we want to. One of the biggest thing in that is basically SD card FS and IAN. And so we want to make sure we are comfortable with whatever is there. One of the, well, I think there are talks about SD card FS later that'll tell you about uh, exactly which direction we are going to go. Uh, there are Android side changes needed for this to happen as well, and I think most of these are already done in AOSP, which included adding modprobe support and basically splitting the init RAMFS into, in order to make sure modules can be loaded from RAMFS and there can be a, there can be a hardware specific module that is needed for booting a device or mounting uh, storage, for example, that, that, uh, that is available. So basically, how desktop distros have been working for years, pretty much. Uh, this is pretty much, this is Matthias' slide from yesterday. Basically, we already have enabled uh, the ABI monitoring and enforcement AOSP. Uh, this, the way, TLDR for this is the way this work is, if you end up changing an uh, in-kernel API or ABI, our tree hugger or pre-submit basically fails and doesn't let us check in that code. And so until we actually 
update the API with a next change and we basically merge them both together. That basically tells us what are we continue to, what do we continue to keep changing and what is being changed even in RCs as we merge from mainline as well. Uh, it has been working with a couple of quirks but we are going through those. Uh, def config, so this is basically what I want to talk about here. We are noticing a bunch of problems for what we want to do. Bas now the idea is we want to have an ARM64 kernels where uh, you can have you can have that kernel run on any given device and and it basically makes everything functional as the device specific drivers load into that kernel. Turns out that's actually difficult to do with ARM64 uh, because of a bunch of things. One is there are a lot of drivers that actually have uh, config arch dependencies. And, there are, and these dependencies, as we find, found out, are not necessarily build dependencies. They're neither are there any symbol dependencies. They're just dependencies because we know that piece of that particular hardware only exists on a particular architecture. And that uh, particular conf, uh, config arch, for example, it can be config arch QCOM or config arch MediaTek or whatever it can be. That is, and that's actually problematic because now you can't create a kernel that basically is generic and this, the, these drivers actually plug into them. So that, that's problem number one. Second problem, and you'll see I actually had links to a lot of AOSP commits, which is a hack that we're working around right now. And I think we're adding dummy kconfig fragments right now in order to basically get a bunch of subsystems to building. Because these subsystems, as far as I remember, only are selected in kconfig. They can't be just switched on and you have the framework code built as part of the kernel because the drivers need it. So most of the drivers just select them. And uh, yeah, and there are, I'm pretty sure there are more examples than this. So what we're doing for now, and we'll be sending emails again, but I'd like, like to know how do we solve this problem, is basically we're adding a dummy config which solely for the purpose of selecting these configs. Just so we have a kernel which basically has every, all the subsystems built in, <coughs> and then the drivers can probe. But that's actually definitely wrong if I'm not missing. So maybe there's, some of these are probably easy just, oh, you just make them try, uh, make them Boolean or try and give an option to select them. But as of now, at least that's not true. So we are finding a lot of those. Uh, device dependencies. Oh, deferred probe was another fun thing. It works. Uh, it it work. But now, for example, if you have if you are a phone and you're deferring probe because you're discovering devices out of order then you're actually going to finish booting about 10 times slower than a normal phone. And that's a problem because we don't necessarily want to say, oh, you do you do this generic kernel and now you regress boot time, so it's never gonna happen. Uh, this is a solvable problem if you know the probe order, but how do we know that is an open question. Uh, I think there have been discussion around this as well in the mailing list. Uh, cyclic dependencies between devices, same thing, uh, basic, and even the post boot device state cleanup. That basically, the last one actually talks about, there are sub, some frameworks, and I'm, I don't remember which one exactly, but there are some frameworks where it, what, what ends up happening is you, you boot a device, and at that time there'll be, uh, there'll be some measures, power saving measures upright. Up oh, I think it was regulator, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Mark's here, thank you. <clears throat> <All right. laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I actually, like, yesterday okay. or something, applied a patch which will um, work around the regulator thing. It will now wait uh, 30 seconds after boot to, uh, <laughs> uh, to, to power off the regulators. So uh, if you haven't, man and if you haven't managed to load your modules on your phone in 30 seconds, uh, you've got a problem anyway. Well, so it'll probably solve your problem for the regulators. Not necessarily true. No, no, no. I want to make sure everybody knows it. Not necessarily true. Because, for example, having these modules also enables something unique for us. For example, with Treble, we separated HALs down, right? So we don't necessarily add or start all the house because of whatever, memory or whatever reason. For I'll give you a normal example. Sure. Uh, is you, you, you can defer starting camera health because you don't need camera for boot. But if I'm deferring starting camera health, then I want to make sure all the camera drivers are loaded when the hell is started. So there goes your 30 second time right there. Yeah, uh, you, yeah it's really only important, uh, critical for the display though. Uh, okay. Because everything else you can just power up again later on. 
there's a use case, for example, Android Auto, they want to turn on the camera in the bootloader so that when you're reversing your car, you can see it before the kernel boots up. So it's not as simple as that, I think. All right, I'll give move on. Uh, I'd rather not talk ion, if possible. Uh, uh, well, I know there is a solution around to actually uh, around DMA buff heaps, and we all like it, and we'll should do that upstream. We do, however, have to do something about ion uh, for the purposes of GKI, which means we're going to change the UAPI again for ION, but it'll be only Android. I didn't even bother sending those patches upstream. If anybody wants to see them, just tell me, I'll send them. But I figured nobody will be interested. What? Yeah, exactly. So, But the, 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 the reason why we need to is because Android have started using ION now, which means uh, previously ION was only used by HALS. But now that there is Android dependency, that means we can't necessarily have uh, we, we need to have some sort of consistency, con consistency across devices for Android to be able to use it. As simple as a system heap may have any given ID as of today. So we're trying to fix all of that in order to at least standardizing those heap IDs. And that's the whole reason why we are changing iron right now. You will not see those patches. Don't worry about it. Uh, we have a plan for SD card FS as well, which is to, uh, I think I'm going to steal Daniel's thunder and say not to use it. But we are figuring out. Uh, we have a couple of things in mind uh, for how do we do that, and uh, Daniel's going to talk about it more. Uh, case folding support, I think Daniel did in both the file systems that mostly end up uh, getting used in Android for on user data, uh, ext4 and f2fs, and that definitely helps with the SD card fs, and you'll hear more about it. LMKD again, uh, I think the in kernel and low memory killer went away f since 4.12. All Android minimum kernel versions will be like 4.14 and onward. So we want to make sure LMKD works for everybody. So we are working with everyone to make sure the user space low memory killer works. So we never see the in-kernel one. And now uh, that way, basically, we get rid of all of our, at least try and remove all of our uh, user space long-standing uh, problems, if you will. And SD card FS also has a nice side effect of all the patch stack that we've been carrying goes away with it. Uh, Android, anybody interested in me? So basically, this is as actually simple as mod probe. We didn't have mod probe in Android, so now we added mod probe. Uh, it also allows us to have configuration and dependencies between modules. We can have build time dependencies, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody who's familiar with Linux and distros already know this. Android didn't, now it does. Uh, but split RAM FS is another interesting thing because it allows us to say, Give it a, either give a choice, or if there's a specific uh, module that we have in GKI that we know because every hardware is different and there are custom implementation right now, it allows the second RAMFS to override the first RAMFS. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the whole purpose of the split RAMFS. And it also keeps the ownership separate, because then on any given device, we can have our RAMFS and the, our kernel. You can just literally put it, flash it on device, and everything should just work. That's the whole idea of splitting where the modules are sourced from. Uh, Linaro obviously is helping us with making all the AOSP dev board work with the GKI. We have, we have to miles to go, and we know that, but we've come along from where we started. Last year, I just talked it in, in, into existence. This time, we actually have problems to discuss, uh, real ones. There is another, uh, but right, it, all of our changes and everything is in AOSP. Whether you have problems, questions, what we are up to, by all means, that's the email address that you reach out to. You just email us and we'll be, we are fairly responsive. Uh, and that's it, that's all I have. Any comments? <laughs> right, am I right on time? There you go. This, this is special. All right, so um, my guess is we're out of time. All right. Hi, I'm Matthias. Um, whoever was on the yesterday's version of the talk is pretty much the same, but feel free to just interrupt me whenever you feel there is a question, because um, I promise it gets more and more boring towards the end. Um, <laughs> um, because of the material, uh, just examples and stuff. Um, 
Um, I'm talking about how we can uh, monitor and stabilize the in kernel ABI, as Sandeep just mentioned. Um, we want to um, create a generic kernel image, and so we want to reduce um, the many, many kernels that we have around for, for different devices, and so we want to consolidate on, on, on a single ABI slash API um, to actually achieve that, to, to agree on things and also keep things stable. Um, so why do we do that? Um, yes, I know there is stable API nonsense, and we should not do that. And I'm not talking about mainline. I'm not talking about latest mainline. I, I'm talking about that particular case that we are having um, uh, LTS kernels. Um, yeah, we want to decouple development of the kernel and its modules, and <laughs> um, we want to decouple the development of uh, the kernel and its modules. Um, not because we, we don't <coughs> like uh, the modules to be in tree, but the reality, reality is just that like, modules are developed outside, and so we have to accommodate to that. Um, as I said, we want to provide a single kernel ABI API uh, for that ecosystem of, of vendor modules that we just have um, to eventually reduce fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation that we have several kernels per Android version, um, almost a kernel per device, um, like heavily forked. Um, where is this coming from? As Sandeep said, yeah, basically the story of, mo uh, of decoupling vendor parts from, from generic parts continues into the kernel. Um, to, to have a generic kernel image, uh, generic kernel modules, that expose an API slash ABI um, towards something that is vendor specific. Um, and exactly this, this blue border we want to control and monitor. Yeah, that, that slide should be familiar. Um, someone used it already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I will, I can skip a bit. It's, see, it, it contains the asterisk at hem hematic tool chain. We are not yet really there, but um, almost. Um, so we, we cannot just say we have an in-kernel ABI and we keep that stable. So we have to make some constraints under which we do that. First of all, we, we limit ourselves to LTS branches. So um, in that case, Android 4.19, Android 5X, whatever that will be. Um, we also only support that single configuration uh, that is relevant for us uh, or for Android, uh, the generic kernel image configuration, we, we can call it, uh, where we, where we agree with, with uh, partners and vendors and um, users of Android um, on, a, on a common configuration. Um, Obviously, the toolchain has a significant influence on, on how binaries are built and what effects it can have on, um, on, the, tool uh, on, on, the, on the ABI that we expose. Um, so in, in that particular version of Android, uh, of Android kernel, we only build with Clang, um, and we restrict ourselves to that hermetic toolchain uh, where we contain every tool that, that we use during the build, um, not only compilers, linkers, but down to you name and prots, whatever is used indirectly uh, by makefiles and, and so on. Um, we also try to restrict the scope um, of, of what we want to keep stable. So we just, at the moment, we are saying whatever, whatever is observable uh, by the bi what, what the binary exposes is kept stable. Um, in the long run, that, that will not be our only scope. We will um, most likely drill that down to whitelists, maybe use um, symbol namespaces um, to say we, we keep these kind of symbols stable. Um, yeah. Any question? How do we do that in, in the kernel build? So basically, we still use make and whatever uh, upstream is used as a make tool, so we, we don't replace that. But we wrap that um, to actually come to the point that we have a hermetic tool chain uh, cross compiler setup, um, build, a, build directory, distribution directory in a, in a way that we can later integrate it into the, to the platform build um, very, very easily. Um, and obviously, we also integrate the ABI tooling, like extracting ABI and um, comparing ABI against the reference. And to show that it's actually easy to use and that it's actually um, easy to integrate in, in, in automation. It's literally three commands if you have installed repo, which maybe uh, is, is okay to assume in an, in an Android context. Um, so literally getting the sources, repo soon gets everything, including the sources, but also the tool chain and every necessary tool. 
Um, and build ABI is just building the kernel with that tool chain, Hermetic, and creates um, an ABI representation and compares it um, if, if necessary against the reference. Also that slide we saw already earlier. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's literally what, what happens. So if uh, if we if you're on a branch where a baseline is defined, that is currently the case for Android 4.19 and Android mainline, where we where we do that exercise, even though it breaks continuously from upstream, um, we we keep that reference there and we want to keep it stable um, as much as we as much as we can. And every time someone breaks it, even if the upstream merge um, comes in and breaks it, we see these kind of differences reported every time um, as part of our um, continuous integration process. So even though, yeah, if, if Greg merges the, the upstream kernel in, yeah, we see the breakage and we um, update the reference, um, but we still see what all is regularly breaking, what if the tooling is working. Um, under the hood, we use uh, libabigail. Um, libabigail is a, a set of libraries and tools um, to analyze binaries. Um, historically, it was used for user space binaries, um, but got kernel support fairly recently, a couple of years ago. Um, it, yeah, it, it can work with ELF binaries in general, but it, it understands the way ker uh, kernel symbols are exported in the ksumtab and makes use of that. Um, in addition, it uses dwarf information to get um, line information, um, type names, uh, and all this that we need to actually compare um, since ELF is not, for example, encoding return types or, or anything else other than the name. Um, we, we need additional information from Dwarf to actually extract uh, ABI relevant stuff. Um, 419 kernels are almost supported. The patches uh, on the on the list and for review um, so latest master Abigail, uh, given that patch is merged soon, um, should be able to to work with 419 kernel modules um, and and kernels. And yeah, how does it look like um, our representation? Um, on on the left side, it's it's not really kernel code, but um, it it should give an impression. We have we have a struct there. We have um, like kind of a a, a nested data type. Um, we have functions that refer to that struct um, by pointer or by, by the struct itself. We have an enum. Um, and on the right side, you can see how that is captured. So first of all, we, we look at the, the elf, um, the elf uh, symbols that are along with the binary, defined in the case uh, in the kernel case, but in, uh, in any other case, uh, just as an elf uh, symbol. Um, okay. In addition, so you see the all these data structures from the left. Um, in addition, um, that comes from the uh, from the draft information uh, where we see the declaration of that enum, even though it's not an, an elf symbol. We see um, the um, I, I left out some parts of the, of that, but the essential parts you can see the function declaration um, with uh, <coughs> the types, the parameter ty parameter types. For example, this um, um, type ID three, which refers to that enum here. So you see func enum. First parameter is that is that enum, um, and it's referred to here as a, as that type. So whenever there is a change in that particular enum, it will be tracked. Um, similar for for structs, and it's also um, you can you can use the hmm? type time time. Uh, I can. Thirty seconds before we start discussion. Okay. Um, as I said, it gets a bit. Yeah, how how does a breakage actually look like? Um, one of the one of the very easy cases is removing a function. So our tooling will report that as removed function. Um, another case is obviously adding a function, which is technically not a breakage in that case. Um, but still, if you want to if you want to keep your ABI stable from that moment on, you have to consider it as part of your ABI, since an additional change might break that particular part that you just added. Um, so that that's a thing that you have to Five consider. Um, I have a couple of questions at the end that might be of interest if no one has any questions. Um, <laughs> All right. 
Here's the question. Um, so I've been at your prior talk where you were talking, where you got into some of the corner cases that you couldn't cover. Yes. Um, have you thought about you might be able to cover those problems if you had access to the source code? Because like, for instance, when you're looking at ABI changes like in an LTS context, you've got all the source code of it there that you could be analyzing. Um, you mean? So the tool right now works with binaries. But if you back that up a little bit, you take a look at the source code that's changed as well. Yeah. So just think about it in the context. You've got access to all the source too. Could you make the tool better by going back and taking a look at the source besides just the binary? Well, we are, we are currently capturing like what is observable from the binary because that is that is kind of the truth what we're actually exporting to to everyone else. And considering not only elf but also dwarf information is something that is extending that um, beyond that usual scope. So we're actually getting source code information into that. Um, like line information, type information, that is usually not part of like part of the ELF uh, exposure there. Um, so, so we are kind of getting that. But I think what you're more talking about, whether we, we do actual like analysis of changes that come into that, or like really taking the source code, that's not the tool for it. Okay. Um, that's not what we are doing with that tool. Maybe, maybe another tool is there more useful because, yeah. Okay. We are not doing patch analysis. We're doing, like, literally um, comparing the results yeah. of it. Yeah. Results also. The, there is not only the source code that could change. It's also the the tool chain. Uh, if we are upgrading the compiler, that that might be uh, a compatible. Uh, that might be uh, possible in a compatible way. So we might upgrade to Clang, whatever, ten, eleven. And, and do that in a way that is uh, compatible. Any further questions? questions yeah, one, one other question I, I had in mind is um, how do people think about runtime checks, like using not necessarily lib, lib Abigail, but mechanisms like lib Abigail um, at runtime, like let's say at module load time, not not uh, the ones that are already there, but like literally looking at the binaries only. I think what Matthias is asking is, does anybody know if mod versions work? <laughs> <laughs> so I was in uh, Doji's talk about LibAbigail at the tool chains microconference this morning, and yes. uh, Peter Z had some pretty strong opinions about uh, runtime stuff, so I'd suggest following up with him um, to see if he actually has uh, some suggestions or if it's he's just saying, no, you can't do this at runtime or other things like that, so. Um, I did not hear the, the runtime part from him. I, I think, wasn't Peter just, he didn't want to do this, right? Oh, we can ask him. But I think we need something like mod versions at runtime, yes. If we can make mod versions work, there are real use cases for it, independent of Android. Yeah, I, I think the question is more also, um, are we able to trust that kind of tooling to omit these runtime checks? You mean the drop mod version? We got one minute. Oh, please stand up when you're talking. Yes, I mean, yeah, we <laughs> Don't stand up, please. <laughs> I mean, we just want something like mod versions to work at runtime. I mean, that's, that was the goal, right? So, yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay. 30 seconds. Anyone? Have you, have you got, like, some sort of plan to, like, if you go to rebase a kernel to try and get back to the old ABI somehow? Or you mean something in between compatibility between 5. Dot like, something yeah, and 419? Yes, like trying to actually enforce an ABI as opposed to you know, just noticing that it's broken. I think that it's in the same category like keeping main lineups uh, um, compatible. I think that's not something Sorry. that we should do at that time. Okay, so what I'll do uh, for the future presentations is if you're close to the five minute mark for discussion, I'll tell you you have one minute left for presentation, all right? Hey, uh, I'm Saravana from the Android kernel team too. And I'm here to talk about uh, some of the issues we face with respect to modules and device dependencies. 
and how we think we could solve them. Um, okay. So some base terms before we proceed. Um, I call driver as a piece of software that knows how to operate a hardware IP. I define device as an instance of a hardware IP and it can have more than one of them. And the device is probed by a driver and if the driver knows how to operate the device and it can get all the resources it needs, then the probe succeeds. Um, to give some context, here's like a simplified view of a boot flow. So when you do a hardware reset or uh, the boot order starts running, either one of them could turn on uh, different resources on the chip. So hardware reset might turn on a bunch of power supplies so that it can actually boot. Boot order might go ahead and turn on the display and UART. Um, say around RCNet call, the kernel probes, the supplier drivers. So the clocks and regulators could be probed around that time. Around dev device and at call level, say the display driver and the UART driver probes. And around latent at call sync, um, the kernel will go and clean up the hardware state. So for example, since all the consumers have uh, probed for the regulators, you could go and turn off all the regulators and it'd be safe to do so. Except it's not really true. Uh, there's no guarantee that the consumers are probed by latent call sync. And um, if you turn off the resources that are used by devices that have not been probed yet but are still on, you could have the system crash or misbehave. Uh, so today the kernel boot sequence is kind of like a delicate set of dependencies. Uh, people use init call order to manually order uh, device probing, except it's not really ordering device probing, it's really ordering driver registration. So if you have uh, more than one device that is probed by the same driver, you can't really order them if they have different ordering requirements. Because you can only control the first time you register a driver, and not when the device gets probed. And finally, the deferred probe throws all of this out the window. Like, you didn't call order, it doesn't mean anything. Once device probe, uh, deferred probe kicks in. And then once you have modules, again, modules are loaded after latent call sync, so you can't really do the cleanup at latent call sync. You can do the 30 second one, but we'll talk about that. Uh, so why are we interested in this? Like um, Sandeep talked about it, we want to have one kernel that can boot all the different products. And we want to have the drivers for each hardware specific stuff as a module. So that's where our interest comes from. Uh, so well, do you have any solution? Thankfully, I have dev uh, device links, which I think is going to help us. Um, except it's almost there, not fully there. So it's an, a device links is an upstream API functionality framework, whatever you want to call it, in uh, driver core. Uh, it allows you to track consumer supplier dependencies. So you can say this device is a consumer of another device. And then it allows you to, or more, it enforces ordering. So it, it won't try to even probe the consumer before the supplier is probed. And then after the supplier is probed, and if the consumer is probed, it keeps track of the state of each of these devices, saying has the supplier probed, has the consumer probed. Based on that, it'll update the status of the link. Um, and then the other missing pieces are that with device links, it has no mechanism to let the supplier know that all the consumers have probed, so it can go ahead and do, say, state cleanup in a safe way. And it also needs some other entity to go create the device links. It's not going to populate the device links on its own. That's not the point of the framework. And there's no way for all the consumers um, there's no way to know when all the consumers have successfully linked to a supplier. So if you go check, are all my consumers probed before all your consumers can link to you, the meaning of the question isn't really useful. Um, so how do we solve this puzzle? Uh, I think we just need two pieces to solve this thing. Uh, first is um, update the device links in the driver core, of driver core so that we can have a callback at the bus or driver level to let the device supplier know that all its consumers have probed. So I've added like a sync state callback to uh, driver ops and for the bus ops. And the second part is having the firmware go ahead and create the links so that uh, you have all the dependency information in the firmware so you can go create the links and once you create the links, uh, it kind of solves itself. Or device links solves all the issues for us. Um, one question that often comes up, and I've talked about this to other people, is uh, why don't you have the driver create the links? Uh, the problem is that uh, there's no way to differentiate between have all the consumers been added and linked to the particular supplier versus uh, the module not being loaded at all. So there's like no way to differentiate when that transition happens. And then also there's no good way to ensure that the consumer gets a chance to link itself to the supplier 
before the supplier goes ahead and asks for, hey, are all my consumers probed? Uh, and then if you let the firmware create the device links, you have these benefits. So whether you're going to use the driver as a module or statically compiled in becomes irrelevant to the problem you're trying to solve. Because the firmware knows the details of the links, you don't need to wait for the driver. And then the other benefit is that um, we can know when all the consumers have been added because the firmware is going to populate all the devices. You kind of know what's going on there. And you're not waiting for a driver to be loaded to achieve that. And then it also makes it pretty easy to give a chance to the consumer to link itself to the supplier devices because the firmware is going to do it for the device. And um, so for that, I can add it like a callback to the firmware node, which is like a framework uh, that can go create the links. And if it's with respect to patches, um, that's the latest version of the patch set. Uh, there are more subtle details about this that are captured in the commit text and documentation I tried to put in there. And that's about it. <laughs> How fast was that? That's awesome. You're, you still got eight minutes to go. Okay, maybe it should have taken longer. <laughs> so one more. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, one issue with the um, waiting until uh, all the consumers have loaded is you're assuming that the system has any intention of loading a driver for every consumer. Um, so uh, you, if you've got a device on the system that's described in your device tree or ACP or whatever, uh, but for what, it, but the support just isn't in the kernel you're using. Uh, then all the resources it uses get wedged in their boot state, right? Uh, which uh, may not be desirable. But it opposite might also not be desirable. So for oh, example, yeah, the, 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 I'm not saying there's a good solution. I'm just I'm exactly just saying. That so I think if that, it was that, able to boot in that wedge state, I think it's better to leave it in a state that we know will work, than trying to change it to a state that might not work. So for example, you can have a backlight. Uh, yeah. so device the, 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 and you don't so have a driver for it. Yeah, so the, the reason the regulator API and the clock API do this is because um, there are board, uh, particularly on older PMIX, you had uh, boards powering up with uh, things that weren't uh, things enabled that were never ever going to be used. And because they were never ever going to be used, there was no software to clean up after them. Therefore, we need something to run along and clean up the default hardware state. Right. Uh, so it, it's it's not it's, it's like not the, the, the hard the default hardware state is not necessarily the known good state, although it might be good. It's definitely known functional state, right? It might not be good in terms of power, but definitely functional. So if you have a backlight and you don't have a driver for it, I would rather have the backlight on than you go turn it off and I can't see anything, right? And uh, also at the worst case, you can always come up with a dummy driver and you can override the driver just force probe it if you need to, if you really need to. It's still better than having a timer or just turning it off out of nowhere. Oh. Aim for the head, please. I, I know. <laughs> I, I actually have a question. I have a question. Can you close it? The, the, the problem with the uh, device tree having uh, devices described that may not have drivers, wouldn't this, wouldn't this actually force us to make sure there are drivers and there are no additional nodes described in device tree that nobody uses? Aim for the head. So, so you're, you're going to get my... Up you're going to get my upstream kernel to uh, have full power VR drivers, are you? Great. Thank no, you for no, solving no, this no. problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying. I'm saying if the node is defined in the device tree, yeah, yeah, but if what, it no, doesn't have the driver, then you're asking for it. Not, not necessarily. It's not the framework problem. It's just because you don't have the driver, and you define an extra node that's not even needed in your hardware. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but my hardware shipped intended to be run with your, the proprietary kernel, and I'm running upstream on it. In the right, but the device tree is the same either kernel. That's the problem. But again, I, I guess my main that. point is that it's at least a known functional state. It might not be power efficient. It's better than going and turning them off without being sure. You can crash the. You can either leave it a bad power state or crash the device. Yeah, uh, I'd go for the former. So yeah, actually, there, there were some. There were some of them with the old P mix where they didn't really run that stably <laughs> if you left all the regulators on. Bad hardware. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it was like the, the PBIC was non-reprogrammable, so they had to do it. And they were just like, boot up quickly, turn this off, uh, and it probably won't bl blow anything up, but it's yeah. not good. But I think on a more serious note, if you really need something like that, I think you can always have like a dummy driver that you override in, if you really need to fix it that way. It's like a weird hardware to weird things. I have a question. We have started to... Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Well, we have started to uh, add device links between uh, pin control 
consumer handles and uh, pin control providers, and there is a patch set for doing the same for GPIO, so that consumers of GPIO lines um, uh, create a link back to the to the GPIO controller. So we are doing that in the core subsystem code. Is that how you perceive we should be doing it, or should these links be created elsewhere? Are we doing the right so, thing? So um, the way I see it, I mean, you could do it that way, but adding the support to my patch set is super easy. You just have to add like three to four lines of it, just to know how to parse the p handle. So you don't have to do it in every framework level. Just add like a one, like few liners to the patch series, and you got it. Well, we also support board files and you know a ACPI. Sure. So, but then uh, another nice thing about device links is if you already have a link and you try to create another one, nothing goes wrong with it. Ah, okay, yeah. that's nice. All right. Fair enough. Uh, oh, Frank, Siri, I've been looking for you. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, so off the record, the patch has fucking nicer and cleaner. I can see it on the mic, too. It's okay. I'm getting all the way through yet. You're doing it off the record. Off the record. One thing that I had proposed, um, one thing that I had proposed while going through this, this patch set was an alternate approach, which is, have the bootloader pass the information to the kernel about what devices it had powered up. And then the framework could claim uh, do a get on any resource. Therefore, it wouldn't get shut off until a driver had appropriately done a put. That's been pushed, I've gotten a lot of pushback against that because of a desire to not um, update all the bootloaders. <laughs> yeah, that's but but that's, that's a, a much more direct approach, I think, <laughs> and avoids a lot of these problems. It, although it's encountering other problems with bootloaders. Yeah. And also, I so. think if the kernel has all the information to do the right thing, you don't have to depend on the bootloader. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. We, we need to talk a little bit more sure. after this. There's, there's one more corner case that, that you may have explained to me before and I've forgotten. But Sounds good. Let's talk after. Yeah. Rob, I thought I saw Rob in here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> no questions or comments, Rob? <laughs> Oh, uh, one other oh. thing. <laughs> I, I did hear that uh, STM wanted, ended up using my patch series because it helps them. I don't know how or why, but they seem to be using it. I'll try to get more information on that. So how do you create your, your device links? You say you pass the firmware? Oh, sorry, yeah, good question. Sorry. Uh, in so firmware nodes is like, so say ACPI and device tree, they're all firmware, and they can have a generic firmware node concept. So every device has a firmware node. So it has a bunch of ops. You can, like every firmware needs to support a bunch of ops. One I added to that saying add device links, kind of. So it's in the callback to the f devices firmware node saying, hey, can you please create the device links for me? In the case of device tree, I go parse the common bindings, like say clocks, regulators, uh, interconnects to is another example. And how, how about the dependencies that are expressed through device specific properties in the device tree? So not clocks Correct. or GPIO. Okay, uh, I did have a suggestion for that, but. It's a heated debate. Because you're only known to the driver as a problem. <laughs> exactly. So I, pr I proposed having something called depends on where you can have a common description of what other devices you depend on if it's not captured by a common generic binding. Right. But there are pushback for that for some valid reasons, mm. some debatable reasons. So. And have you thought about what's going to happen when you unload the modules? Um, device links allows you to delete the device link as a device gets unbound. Right. So if you set the flags right, it shouldn't matter. But you're not addressing the problem of having a supplier and a provider uh, where the, <coughs> the provider module is unloaded and the supplier then crashes. So you have, a you have a consumer and a, uh, supplier. And, uh, and a supplier, and the supplier module gets unloaded, and all of a sudden the consumer doesn't have the, so the resource anymore. Uh, I wasn't trying to solve that, but Device Link already solves that. So it can force the, 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 un it yeah. can force the unbinding of the consumers. Okay. Before you unbind, there's a lot of flags you can set. It makes a lot of things nicer too. It also makes sure, for example, if you set the flags right, uh, you can make sure that even in runtime suspend, those devices suspend first before yes. your regulator yeah. or pin control, yeah. whatever needs to suspend. It's actually pretty nice. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally not trying to solve them because I'm trying to keep my patch set focused. But adding those things is just adding another flag in one right. line. Thanks. Just. Just quickly uh -huh. to go back to the ST case, I think it was to show dependencies between the display and the backlight, which um, they were trying to solve generically, which in my opinion should just be a specific. 
the, like no, I, the one I heard is specifically not a liquid <coughs> display. It's not a display. Sorry. Something Sorry. with power control. Alistair. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Alistair Delva. I'm the manager of the Cloud Android team. Um, I uh, want to talk to you today about how we're using virtualization on Android and um, where it's being used, uh, where we see it going. Um, so Android has a number of virtual devices, AVDs we call them. Um, the Android emulator is probably the one that most people know. Uh, it's part of the Android Studio. It's distributed as part of the Android Studio. Uh, my team works on Cuttlefish, which is the, uh, a validation platform for, uh, for framework engineers rather than application developers. Um, and there are also uh, other virtual devices out there, proprietary virtual devices, open source virtual devices, uh, Acorn, uh, Cocos, various implementations for automotive and IoT. Um, Almost all of them use Vert.io, and the Vert.io drivers, block, console, net, RNG, everybody uses these. Um, they just work. Um, so kind of deep diving into Cuttlefish. Uh, Cuttlefish is based on CrossVM, which is a, a hypervisor uh, written by the Chrome team. Um, it runs either on your local machine or on Google Cloud. Um, Uh, we dropped QMU because uh, we have more internal support for CrossVM than we did for QMU. There are teams at Google that use QMU and work on QMU, but not like we, not the kind of synergy that we have with CrossVM. Another reason is that we can run Cuttlefish directly on Chrome OS without requiring the installation of another hypervisor. So the, the other reason is that in, as part of adding things to Vert.io, um, we, we, we do want to add it everywhere, and I'll go, I'll go into that later but we're kind of focusing on adding it to CrossVM first. Um, so uh, Cuttlefish is developed upstream. It's developed in EOSP. We don't do it behind the scenes and then release it every year. It's actually developed openly in EOSP. Everybody can try it out. I encourage everybody to do so. I did a talk last plumbers about that, how to get the code and how to build and set it up. Um, and you can test mainline upstream Linux on it. You don't need an Android kernel. You can use just uh, upstream Linux it boots on Cuttlefish, it will boot to Android. Some functionality is impaired without using the Android patches, but mainline does work. Um, and we originally used a kind of hand-rolled virtual SOC architecture, which was based on a driver that I upstreamed last year called Virt uh, VSOC, virtual SOC. Um, but we're now more aligned to Vert.io. Um, so Cuttlefish and P used VSOC, didn't use Vert.io. It used a shared memory architecture based on QMU called IVSHMEM. Um, and uh, this was always considered by, by me anyway as a stopgap. So I, we did upstream the driver because we wanted people to be able to use Cuttlefish upstream, but the long-term plan was to move to Vert.io. Um, and that helped us set up our kernel testing and our common kernel validation, um, uh, allows us to test upstream uh, in our virtual platform without relying on patches and without relying on uh, having done the Vert.io conversion. And I'll explain why that was difficult. Um, as you can see in the diagram, we have various regions exposed by this VSOC driver, audio, Gralic, Harbor Composer, input, real D, and Wi-Fi. Um, all of those uh, regions um, were basically shared memory. And there was a custom protocol that ran between the guest and the host. And uh, kind of all the clever stuff was done through this VSOC driver. So basically, we're duplicating what Vert.io does, uh, but not as well. Um, we also, for our Wi-Fi implementation, used Mac 802.11 hardware sim, which again, I'll go into in, in a moment, why that was hard and caused us problems. Um, so Cuttlefish and Q, which is uh, something that we kind of wrapped up, because of the way our branching model works, we kind of wrapped this up in, in March. And uh, this is supporting CrossVM now instead of QMU, but more drivers have been aligned to Vert.io. So we, some drivers, we like the audio driver, AC97 driver, um, we, we switched to using emulated hardware instead of uh, a, the VSOC driver just as a stopgap to, to, de to lose uh, dependency on that driver, but we know it's not kind of an ideal solution. Um, but for most of the other ones, we were able to convert them to use VSOC, uh, so to use Vert.io. So input uses Vert.io input. Uh, Wi-Fi is now using a driver that we came up with called Vert Wi-Fi, which was upstreamed. 
Um, and it also uses vSockets, which is uh, kind of a almost a direct replacement for vSock. It's essentially a byte stream from the guest to the host. Um, now in AOSP master, which is the situation today, uh, we have got rid of the vSock driver entirely, um, and we are now using Vertio for everything. The biggest job, obviously, was Vertio GPU, which required a lot of changes to many components. Um, and we know that there are other, lots of people are interested in using Vertio GPU now, and there are lots of people using Android with Vertio GPU. Um, and obviously, Chrome OS was using Vertio GPU on CrossVM for Linux compatibility, Linux application compatibility. Um, so all of those efforts from everybody involved in that process, you know, has made this very straightforward for us um, to use on Android. Um, so anybody who's interested in running with the Vertio stack, the Vertio GPU stack can use uh, the launch CVD command, which is the Cuttlefish virtual device with mode DRM virtual, and it will switch into using that mode. Um, and then obviously the last step for us is just to drop the VSOC driver entirely um, from upstream. Um, learnings from Vertio GPU. Uh, so um, things, things were, like I said, things were very smooth due to all these other projects using it and it, the code base being very active and live. But the code base was also very active and live, which meant as we were implementing features, things broke a lot. You know, we would have to update our Gralic, our Mesa implementation. We'd have to update our kernel changes, our cross VM changes to keep everything in line. Fortunately, the Chrome OS team are, are doing that for other reasons, so that made the cross VM changes a lot easier. Um, but one of the things we did do end up having to do is because of the Android kernel release model of releasing three kernels per Android release. Um, we did have to backport Vertio GPU to 4.14 and 4.19 because the versions in 4.14 and 4.19 had problems that blocked us from using it on Android. Uh, specifically, um, it's kind of a minor issue, but uh, Vertio GPU had hard coded the, it, 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 it has a hard coded assumption about how large the screen is. Now you can go and set the mode to something else afterwards if you want, but it uses generated EDIDs, which don't work for the kind of devices that Android ships on because they're all. Uh, you know, HDMI modes rather, CEA modes rather than normal kind of uh, legacy uh, modes. And so we backport, that has been solved upstream. There's the ability to inject EDID now and you can customize the modes. And so we've done that. Uh, we also needed fixes for an out fence support. Obviously Android is using that for Harbor Composer. And there were various other small things we needed as well. Um, kind of issues that we encountered that haven't been resolved fully yet are Vertio GPU does support multiple displays, but it doesn't really support multiple planes. Um, we need uh, better pixel support, uh, pixel format support in Vertio GPU 2D. Uh, a couple of examples are video overlay with support would be nice for Android because in full screen video use cases, we need that. Um, and then uh, the, we also bumped into, which is the last point on here, the stride format modifier. We also bumped into some cases where the um, assumed frame buffer format uh, that the kernel will use for the kind of its frame buffer is a uh, byte order that's not supported by Swift shader. Um, so we end up getting into this problem where Swift Shade is rendering in like RGBA and we want BGRA or something like that. Um, and it, it kind of used to work upstream, but it was because it wasn't properly checking it and then the cross VM was doing the wrong thing, but then that was fixed. It doesn't work anymore. These are kind of minor issues, but they're the things that we need to fix. Um, and then other things that uh, other teams at Google have mentioned to me don't work, haven't got a solution right now is uh, the need for uh, being able to Although the guest has to allocate the memory for Vertio GPU, uh, it, it would be helpful if it could do that in a way that was hinted by the host so that it can allocate DMA buffs that are compatible with the host without copying them. Um, so there are some examples where you know, a hardware implementation needs a buffer to be sized correctly for FBC. Now, Virtual doesn't need to know what the format is because it's doing the, the FBC buffer will only be touched by the host, but the guest has to still allocate the buffer appropriately. Um, so there are some, maybe some future changes to make requests for uh, modifiers of the original assumptions of the buffer allocation size. Um, okay, uh, one more thing I just wanted to touch on was camera virtualization. Um, uh, something that we're looking at doing, um, we haven't really started yet. Uh, as you can see here, there's a lot of questions um, about how we would do that, but uh, one thing that would be good would be kind of figuring out how to do Vertio for camera um, and what that should look like. Uh, one driver or many. Uh, kind of how would we test it, what would we expose, etc. Um, I have a couple of other slides, kind of just these are the other Virto drivers that other uh, virtual machines are using. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Dave. Just on the, oh, sorry, 
just on the wanting planes in the Vertio GPU, what would you see the host doing there with like using OpenGL to do the blending and stuff? That's the problem. The reason I never added planes when I designed it was I didn't have a, a, an idea of what I should do on the host side of the host graphics at that point. Yeah, so uh, that's absolutely right. And uh, we kind of I can understand from an acceleration, just kind of desktop acceleration point of view, it doesn't really make sense. But for us, what we want to do is we want to create a kind of better device fidelity. So we want this, we want our virtual device to look like a real device. So we therefore want our DRM device to look like a real DRM device as far as possible. Yeah. Uh, and, and that will allow us to catch user space bugs and assumptions being made by like our DR by our Harbor Composer or by our by Surface Fling or whatever. Now the current mode will require that Surface Fling or essentially uh, blends down the layers inside the guest. So although that work's being done by the host, as you said, it's being done in OpenGL. Yeah. Um, now we'll probably still be using it in OpenGL, but it'll be done on the host instead. Right. Um, so that's kind of a use case we're interested in. The other, the other example is, obviously, if you do that, then you need video texture support as well, because you can't rely on the guests to do that. Yeah, so you need to be able to decode all the video stuff and right, right. blend it in the right color space. Right. And it's, it's so I'm hoping to get started on that soon, and hopefully you'll get some patches from us to add that feature. Cool. Anything else? Uh, I saw some, um, you had some Vertio GPIO there. I haven't seen that yet uh, as GPIO maintainer, so I, I'm uh, eagerly anticipating this thing. There is some patches flying to like take a few GPIOs off the running host and ex export them into the virtual machine as whatever GPIO ship. You could provide very good input to that discussion, so can you just contact me and... Yes, uh, actually, so uh, we'd like to, um, one of the things I want to be careful about is that there are actually, as you pointed out, patches flying around. And as you can see from the list here, there's probably maybe 10 Vertio drivers out there that are being used by projects that have come up with their own Vertio sp specification that hasn't been standardized yet and written a driver for it and they use it in production. So obviously for Android, we'd rather not go down that path. We want to work with everybody upstream and make sure that people agree on the necessity for a particular Vertio implementation and work on that one and only add support for that one. We don't want to add support for non-standard implementations. Okay. It would be nice to be able to like loop you guys in somehow. Yes, so. yes. Uh, I think almost everything on this list that was added to ACORN or ACRN, however you pronounce it, um, that project probably would be something that Android devices would ultimately need. Audio, GPIO, I squared C, HTCP. They're all things we need. CrossVM also has a video decoder um, Vertio implementation. I don't think anybody's attempted, well, I think people have attempted camera, but they do it in a simple way, like, like exporting a DMA buff. There's nobody who has kind of like a managed camera interface in Vertio yet that I'm aware of. That's something else. Sorry for my ignorance, but what is this Acorn thing? Uh, it is a type one hypervisor. Okay. It originally was written by Intel, and I believe it's now a sort of open source project. Uh, it's Project ACRN. If you're interested, you can go and check it out. Okay. And they've got awesome. a bunch of patches against Linux as well. Isn't Virtio Wayland, hasn't Virtio Wayland been replaced by Virtio Visoc? Uh, yes, we do not use Vertio Wayland on Cuttlefish. Oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I've got a little bit. So one of the, another kind of interesting thing was Wi-Fi that's come up recently. So we, for, for virtual Wi-Fi implementations, we used to use Mac 8211 hardware sim, and we would basically tunnel the... The, uh, the Mac 8211 hardware sim, um, the, the kind of fake frames through to the host, uh, and then replay them using an instance of Mac 8211 hardware sim on the, on the other side. That was how we created network bridging using Wi-Fi. But there were lots of problems with that. Like you had to have root permissions. Uh, there was no Ethernet connection running between guest and host, and the, um, the host bridge setup was more complicated. So we came up with a driver that we upstreamed uh, just over a year ago called Vert Wi-Fi, which is an RT Netlink driver that wraps another Ethernet device which is kind of the standard way of doing things in the networking core. Um, and, uh, but one of kind of the open questions would be, the problem with vert Wi-Fi is you can't actually connect two, two, two cuttlefishes, if you like, together. You can't bridge them using Wi-Fi. You can only bridge them using Ethernet. So kind of, do we need a vert IO Wi-Fi as well is kind of an open question. I don't know if there's any networking people here who would have interest or care about that. Nope. <laughs> right. Thank you.
Okay, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I will start by briefly and very briefly introducing the project we've been working on for nearly a year now called Lib Camera and how we want to unify camera support on different Linux systems, including Android, and that's why I'm here today. Um, very, very brief context why we did that. Uh, we're starting a long time ago with extremely simple cameras where you had a sensor, usually a raw sensor, uh, or, <coughs> or a sensor to provide process images. Um, and on the SOC side, you had uh, sensor interface, possibly a scaler, and that's it. And it was easy to control from user space. We had a vfile 2 API that was working totally fine with that, and there was, uh, there was absolutely no problem. Uh, so from a user space point of view, a single video node, a uh, single API, um, and that was it. Then appeared more complex SOCs with more processing inside the SOC, and that's, well, that's more than 10 years old, so it's a simple diagram compared to what we have today. Uh, but you have more processing blocks, and we figured out that it was impossible to control that using the pure vfil to API. So we made API extensions, we created a mirror control API, we exposed uh, the, the internals of the pipeline to user space, and all of, a, all of a sudden, user space application was supposed to interact with tens of devices on the kernel side, and to have deep knowledge of what the hardware was doing. Uh, that was certainly possible when you ma were making a product and had applications and frameworks that uh, were aware of what was inside a device, but not, not something usable for generic applications. It was a product that was well known. Uh, we had s solutions were proposed, uh, uh, I'm talking about 10 years ago when we were working with Nokia, and then you all know what happened with Nokia, so nothing got implemented. So the v 2 community knew that there was a missing component, and uh, last November we started working on that finally. Um, so that's how the LibCamera project started. Um, we were really bad at marketing, so we wanted a name that described a library that handles cameras, and we came up with LibCamera. Um, the idea there is that we wanted to create a whole camera stack, and if you compare it to, compare that to the graphics world, we want to be the measure of the graphics world. So it's a use space stack that's going to go uh, offer a single API towards applications, and we'll handle any cameras regardless of what's underneath. So we have a whole stack defined uh, with uh, applications, frameworks, optional language bindings. So LibCamera is written in C++, so the mini API is in C++, but we want to offer support for other languages too. And we have LibCamera in the middle, and there at the bottom we have all the, all the kernel side. So that's more or less how it looks. Um, what it provides, if you're familiar with uh, how Android handles cameras with the Android camera HAL, we have camera devices, we have enumeration of cameras, we support multiple streams, so you can capture multiple streams at the same time, from the same sensor in different resolutions. Um, we support, we want to support per frame control, uh, and uh, more importantly, we need to support uh, image processing algorithms. So I won't go in depth on how it's done at the hardware level, but that's something that all hardware vendors consider highly valuable and highly proprietary, so they want to ship binary blobs. Um, and uh, on top of that, we want to offer compatibility with the v 4 2 API for existing applications, but more importantly today, uh, also compatibility with Android. So the, the real goal of Leap Camera is to support the whole ecosystem. Um, just a quick word of how we do that internally. That's more or less the architecture of what we have today. Uh, so we have a camera device manager. You can enumerate the cameras. And a camera itself has a, hopefully, as large a possible piece of device agnostic code that we can reuse across all cameras. But there's, in red over there, uh, pieces that are specific to your hardware. So we have what we call a pipeline handler that handles the, uh, the camera receiver inside your SOC, your ISP, all the processing blocks are over there, and another component that isolates the image processing algorithms. And that can be provided by vendors as a binary blob because that's what they do, what they do but we want to also pro provide open source solutions for that, open source implementations. So the goals of Leap Camera are twofold. We want to provide camera support for all Linux systems, and when I say camera support, it means all cameras. It's, uh, we see them today in laptops, in tablets, in phones. So that's all the Linux distributions. What is definitely missing in there because we have uh, we have laptops today that are based on raw sensors and an ISP inside the Intel SOC, and that just doesn't work in Linux. We have absolutely no solution to uh, 
to, to work with that. Uh, and we want that solution also to be usable on, on, on Android and on Chrome OS. And the reason why we want to uh, cover all that is that I mentioned that vendors will provide the algorithms as a binary blob, and there's no way we're going to get those vendors to provide implementations for different Linux-based systems. So Android has a big leverage, Chrome OS does as well, and they can work with vendors and make them support Linux, uh, but the Linux distributions can't really do the same. So we want to provide a single unified implementation that will be to able to reuse the same, um, the same implementation for the vendors and all those systems. Um, and the second point is that I want to create, we want to create an environment that will foster innovation on the camera side. And that means that the camera, to use a camera, you need a big framework. So far, if you look at an Android system that standardizes the camera API at the user space level, everything that's underneath, the camera hub, the kernel drivers, they're all provided by the vendors, and the vendors will keep that quite close. Some implementations are open source, but they don't really upstream kernel drivers, they don't document the interfaces, they don't explain uh, what statistics you can get of the hardware and all that. So it's close to impossible to come up with a fully open source implementation because there's lots of work and information is missing. So by providing a framework that's fully open source and having just one component in there that will be proprietary, uh, we want to force the vendors to document the interfaces there so we can compete with them and we can create open source implementation. Of course, they will claim it's completely impossible, like a GPU people did 10 years ago, it was impossible to create a GPU stack in uh, an open source one, uh, but we all know what happened, so hopefully at some point uh, we'll reach the same with the cameras. So now, for the discussions, how much time do we have left? Oh, good. <coughs> so a bunch of points I would like to discuss today. So we have, uh, as I mentioned, we started development uh, in November last year. Uh, we have demos that we can make. We have a camera hub implementation that has been tested in Chrome OS, uh, not on Android mostly because we didn't really have uh, testing platforms that were easy to use for us. Uh, and I would like to get, not necessarily today, but at least to, to see how we could get feedback from the, uh, uh, both the Android community, but the, well, Google as well, uh, on the design and how we could uh, get that to work correctly with Android and hopefully shift in AOSP. Uh, so that's one thing. I also want to get feedback from SOC vendors. That's not really a question for today because uh, this is mostly about, uh, about Android in the, in the community side, but that's something that I, I would like to, uh, to work on as well. Uh, integration in AOSP and uh, in the context of Project Treble uh, as well, we have discussed that uh, previously. Um, I would like, and we won't have enough time in five minutes, but uh, to provide, we've worked a lot, we've implemented a camera HAL, and there are pain points. There are, um, in the camera HAL API, there are things that are not well suited for uh, for what we did, uh, issues that's been that have been there for quite some time, they're just historical issues, um, and we would like to see how it could evolve in a direction that maybe could take more feedback for the community. Uh, and last but not least, possibly discussions on the Linux kernel camera API because we're using v 2 today, and that's also quite painful for a variety of reasons. Who want to start? Oh, and another point, possibly, how we could use that for virtualization of cameras on Android. Yeah, I was, I was gonna ask, um, in your view, when you're running like Android on Chrome or something like that, let's say there was a like, glorious future where Android runs in a, container, in a virtual machine instead of in a container. Um, how do you view, how do you think that, say, an Android camera app would be able to access camera features using something like LibCamera? I assume LibCamera would be running on Chrome OS, for example. Or yes. yes. Uh, I think that the virtualization should happen at a quite high level. I don't think it makes sense to virtualize the v 4 2 API, whatever kernel API we would have, because we have, as I mentioned, we have lots of components at the kernel level, right. uh, and having to interact with all of them. First of all, uh, you're gonna need uh, hardware knowledge on the, in the guest side. If you want to re-virtualize that and being, being able to run a variety of hosts, you want to emulate a complex processing system uh, that's going to be very really costly to, to emulate in software as well on the host side. Um, and so for that reason, I think an API at this higher level, roughly at the level of the Android camera, HAL, or Lib camera, they, they, they kind of the same level in the camera stack, uh, I think would make much more sense. Okay, awesome. <coughs> and that's something we would like to help with uh, uh, in, in the future if we can work together. I think it would be nice. Uh, 
question. Can you throw that far? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so with supporting the vendor blobs, if the vendor stops supporting the blob, say after two years, how do you make sure that doesn't hamper your future development and lib camera? Okay. Um, so we have two APIs that we want to keep stable, or two ABIs that we want to keep stable in lib camera. Uh, it's the, the one facing applications or facing the Android camera HAL, uh, but also the ABI that's facing the, um, the image processing algorithms. Um, of course, when we release major versions, that's something that we could break from time to time. We can't guarantee that we're going to keep the same ABI for 20 years. Um, but one interesting, I believe, thing about this project is that we, the, the binary blob from the vendor will not be allowed to interact with uh, kernel devices. So we create an ABI there where we know what information we're going to pass to them and we know what information we get back. And it means that it's forcing them to provide some level of documentation there. So it means two things. One, with the information they provide, we can work on open source implementations. Two, if we need to create adaptations between different ABIs because we need to evolve on our side, uh, that's something that is doable as well because they don't control that ABI. Okay. Oh, I, my question was around the Barney Bob. What does the current interface or design look like for those? Are they separate processes? Are they libraries that you expect to be loaded as plugins? Or okay. Um, so the way it works today is that we have one shared library, the Sleep Camera. Uh, the pipeline handlers, the part here that's hardware specific but is open source, is bundled inside Lip Camera. Uh, so we have well, all, all the ones we support. Could be external plugins in the future if we have dozens of them and we want to reduce the boundary size. Um, the image processing algorithms, they loaded as separate plugins, to, so they share libraries. We load them and we isolate them in a separate process. So, and at, as part of that isolation, they're not allowed to access the kernel devices, we control the resources they can use. Um, if we have open source implementation, there will be the option of running them directly in the libcam process, still shared external shared object that we load as plugins, but uh, run directly, because if it's open source as libcamera, then we consider that we can, we can trust the code. But otherwise, we don't want uh, binary and trusted code to be able to crash the system. Same question on the other side of the API, the camera held facing APIs. How does, so the, does lip camera itself run in a separate process or is it basically going to run as part of camera health? Um, so the, uh, the current camera HAL implementation we have right now, it's part of the lip camera uh, binary, the, the shared object, but could be, it could be a separate one, that doesn't matter too much. Uh, it creates threads internally. Uh, but the main entry point of the camera HAL is an init function, and then we create all the threads that we need internally, but it runs in the process of the camera service. Okay. So it's like any camera HAL on Android today. We don't create a separate process internally. Sorry if you m mentioned this earlier. Can you talk about the license? And you say we, so can you just give us an idea of the size of the project, who's involved and such? So the project is licensed under the LGPL2 plus, um, except for the, I think the test suite that we have is, is GPL, but they're just test applications inside the test units. Uh, when I say we, uh, we have five people working on that, uh, spa time, so roughly equivalent to two full time. And we work in close cooperation with the Chrome OS team. That's why I don't do sports. Uh, <laughs> is there any provision to dual license under Apache as well? Uh, that's something we can get discuss. Um, we clearly wanted to avoid vendor forks there, so that's uh, why there was a decision to go for the LGPL2. Um, not to go into too much details, but most of the copyright right now is owned by Google, so Google has some leverage. Uh, but Thank you. when we'll have external contributions, that's going to be a bit different. So I'm going to give a, a bit of an update on uh, Android emulated storage and uh, 
what we're doing with SD card FS. Uh, Sandeep may have given some. Uh... <laughs> yep, some uh, spoilers for that. And that would be a very short talk. You, you get some extra time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so first off, a brief overview of uh, what we currently do with uh, SD card FS. Uh, it provides a layer of uh, case insensitivity for whatever the uh, file system we're running uh, on is uh, similar to what you might see in uh, VFAT for like uh, app compatibility reasons. And uh, we used to have um, shared uh, OBB files where some things would be shared in between users, but we're no longer doing that. So we don't have to worry about that part of it anymore. There's some, um, it also uh, controls how we do uh, some of our app permission handling. And uh, currently, we uh, in, in SD card FS, we can control this via some uh, out of tree patches, which we are very much looking to not use anymore. So that's uh, some motivation for well, some things that we're uh, wanting to move away from. And we're currently using it to uh, kind of control some quota tracking, which uh, could be moved into user space. So, you know, for whether or not it's still uh, needed, we don't do the uh, shared OBB uh, folders anymore. The uh, quota tracking can be moved into uh, user space and uh, possibly switch over to uh, project ID uh, quotas. Uh, the permission uh, changes can also be done through other means, possibly with uh, Read-only bind mounts are part of it, and a uh, like a uh, tempfs for the parts that, you know, if you don't have permission to read or write or anything. And the uh, the last bit remaining is uh, case insensitivity. So some of you may have seen the talk uh, last year that Gabriel did on adding case uh, insensitivity or case insensitivity to uh, ext4. So I've uh, added that over into uh, F2FS as well, though uh, it still does not yet support encryption. So that's something I've been working on adding. And naturally, we, uh, we need to have that. So this is a uh, kind of an overview of uh, what, we, uh, what we have. The red, uh, the red lines require the like, encryption keys. So we have our, uh, our uh, name, we, have, we preserve the case. So we have a, uh, it's a case preserving system, which unfortunately means that there is no direct relationship in between the uh, directory entry and the name as we care about it without access to the key. So one of the big differences that we have here is that we can't really go from what's stored on disk to a hash to be able to look up the entry without having stored that there or having access to the key. So that means some changes in uh, FS script to um, generate a, a hash that we can use. I'm sorry, for the, uh, the no key token, the name that we present when we uh, have not yet decrypted the device. Uh, currently, that sometimes includes the hash in the case of uh, long names, where the, uh, the base64 encoding that we do there uh, prevents you from being able to use a uh, the, uh, full name. There need to be some adjustments there. And uh, along with like uh, passing the hash down. So as this is, we, uh, we currently have a plan for how to go forward with uh, enabling encryption here. Uh, a bit of a typo there. And uh, so one of the minor in inconveniences is that uh, currently for the uh, case folding support in F2FS and ext4, we have some custom dentry operations. And they're basically doing exactly the same thing. And anyone else using this is going to end up having the same sort of operation. So one of the uh, things that I'm looking at is moving that into the, uh, the default uh, ops. So additionally, for the hash, the, um, the hash is based on the case folded name. And naturally, we can't just store the unencrypted uh, hash there. So I, I'm using uh, FSCrypt2 uh, 
to uh, drive a SIP hash uh, to for to get the uh, generate the hash there. And uh, we also change looking to change the format of the uh, no key token. And uh, so currently we have a scheme which is a bit longer than what the uh, default currently is. And I'm, I'm not super attached to it, so if anyone uh, has objections to it being a lot longer than it currently is, uh, let, let me know. And uh, on the ext4 side, uh, currently I don't believe it stores the hash on disk. So probably going to need to take a little bit of more uh, space in that, uh, in that entry to make room for that. And uh, yes, on, a, uh, on another hand, we have uh, some interest in going back to a few solution. We And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have like uh, some features that uh, our other APIs export, and there's uh, some desire to move these so that uh, you have the same sort of things when you're going through our uh, Java APIs or going through direct file access. And uh, you know, in the, uh, I guess, top talk after the break, we'll be uh, looking at uh, ext fuse and uh, po the possibility for improving performance through that. So, I don't know if anyone has any uh, any comments. Uh, questions?
All right, so we'll be starting very shortly. Eileen, can I ask you for the door? Thanks. Right, so same rules as before. Ashish, you got the floor. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashish. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech, and uh, I'm presenting my work, uh, part of my PhD research. Okay. Uh, is that good? So I'm presenting part of my PhD research uh, that says how do you improve uh, performance of Fuse file system uh, using eBPF and how can that be applied in you know, in context of Android. So some background. So uh, early Android devices uh, shipped with micro SD card slots. Um, so users could pop in an SD card and expand uh, the storage. And uh, there was an external partition called SD card, which it was fast, uh, fat enabled, and it would host OBV files and you know user data, <coughs> pictures and videos. Um, later on, this was uh, replaced with virtual SD card. So a part of data partition was exposed as virtual SD card and was fuse managed. Uh, by fuse managed, I mean that the fuse file system was doing the fat emulation and enforcing custom permission checks. So Fuse is a state-of-the-art framework for developing user file system. So uh, because uh, it's in user space, there are a couple of advantages. So you can use existing third-party libraries. You know, it's easy to maintain and debug. Uh, however, it comes with uh, performance overhead. So let's see why. Uh, the main reason of performance overhead is the context switching that happens while serving file system requests in user space. So a Fuse uh, um, allows the user space daemon to register file system handlers with the kernel. And every time there's a request from VFS to serve a, a file system request, the requests are simply redirected to user space where the, where the requests are served. So there's a lot of context switching. And that's why there's performance overhead. And due to the performance overhead, um, Fuse uh, implementation was later on replaced with, uh, uh, with a new file system called SD card FS. It's an uh, in kernel file system. It's a uh, simple, it's based on wrapper file system. So simple functionality is stacked on lower file system using wrap FS. And the functionality was the same fat emulation and enforcing custom permission checks. Um, now, this is in kernel space entirely. So no context switching. However, uh, because it's in kernel space, you know, you need to debug it carefully, yeah, difficult to maintain, out of tree maintenance, and you cannot use you know, complex uh, existing third party libraries. Also results in bloated TCB and has security implications. So what can we do? Well, um, so I'm proposing to use EXT Fuse uh, for uh, managing the stimulated virtual SC card. So um, what this does is, uh, you can have uh, two paths now, uh, a regular path in, in user space, which is the default fuse path. However, you can also have in-kernel handlers, thin handlers, based on eBPF code. So what, what, what does it buy us? So, so you can have near-native performance because you'll be handling some of the requests right in the kernel without switching to user space. And it results in better system reliability. You're not uh, you're not bloating the bloating the kernel. You're you're not adding too much complex uh, uh, complex functionality in the kernel. And uh, because it has the default fuse component, uh, it's easy to you know port and debug and maintain. So let's see how EXT fuse works. So um, like I said, now there are two paths: one slow path, which is in user space, fast path in the kernel space. What happens at mount time is when you mount the file system. Uh, the BPF uh, code or BPF handlers, file system handlers, are inserted into the kernel, verified, and uh, they are executed uh, you know, as a part of BPF uh, virtual machine runtime. So uh, those handlers are very restricted, and uh, they live in a sandbox environment. 
So when an application makes a system call, uh, a file system related call, so step one there goes to VFS, uh, step two is delivered to Fuse driver. Now simply, um, so Fuse driver will not simply redirect to user space. It will first check with the handlers, with EBP, uh, eBPF VM, and if the handler can serve the request in the kernel, it'll di directly serve the request with no context switching to user space. But if it has to fall back to the default path, it will forward the request to user space. So you have both fast and slow path. And eBPF maps are used to share metadata between the, the Fuse daemon in user space and the handlers in kernel. So this is an example of uh, what can be enabled with uh, ext fuse. So this handle open uh, is a part of the fuse daemon. It's in user space. So I've added three lines here. So imap key, imap value. So I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm creating an eBPF map that holds the file descriptor of the lower uh, uh, file uh, in the kernel. And it's uh, instructing the fuse driver that if the handler if the, if the extension in the kernel, if the eBPF code in the kernel says that um, you, if, if the code says pass through, then do not send the request uh, you know, to Fuse daemon, but use this file descriptor as the mapping between upper file and lower file and directly send IO request to lower file. And this is inserted in a map, a special map called inode map. So the read extension, this is part of the kernel, this is eBPF code. So the, uh, it, it, it gets all the parameters that a fuse daemon gets. So it will look up um, the file descriptor um, uh, based on the upper, upper it will use the upper file descriptor as the key and look up the lower file descriptor value. Um, and then it will instruct the fuse driver to do pass through. So as opposed to delivering the read request to user space, the read request is directly delivered to the lower file system. Hence it bypasses the user space context switching and you get uh, a, a you know, very good performance improvement. So I tested with two games, and uh, why games? Because uh, like I mentioned, OBB files are placed on, on um, you know, SD card, and they are archives of small, small files. So if you handle everything in user space, there's a lot of performance overhead. Uh, with uh, ext fuse, you get to bypass that and handle all the requests in kernel directly to the lower file system, and you get performance improvement. Yep, I think that's that's um, yeah. So. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how does the how do those numbers compare to SD card FS? Did you try that? No, I did not. But uh, so it's very close to native. So I, I'm assuming that SD card FS gives you native performance. I probably did, did not okay. get a chance to do that. Yes. And. Uh, the second question was about the maps. Why are there custom maps? Um, so let me go to backup slides. Um, so f this is a meta metadata cache example. So I'm trying to cover more, you know, with, as I answer the questions. So here I'm doing, um, you know, caching of attributes, and uh, because I'm creating custom cache in the kernel, they are the, the 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 request will be served directly in the kernel. So answering the map question, um, there are uh, special maps. Because unlike regular EF eBPF maps, that are accessible to either all processes or the super user process with, with caps sysadmin. Uh, we want Fuse Daemon, which is an un, you know, potentially untrusted and you know, user space unprivileged application, to, um, to, to, uh, to be able to insert code in the kernel, access the maps, and not uh, leak anything. So I've created special maps so that the maps can only be accessed by the Fuse daemon and no other process. I thought this, well, I thought this was already possible with uh, the maps being mapped into the file system with uh, UID and Git standard permission limits on those. So you're saying it's already possible to already yeah. possible to have special maps which are only accessed by a particular process? As far as I know, that's the case, yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, I think... We actually even there. have maps that are readable from Java but writable from daemons. Yeah, uh, so, I, I, so I think when I started working on this, there was n you know, no support of that, but like, you know, if the support is there, we can use it. So they're not... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm almost okay. certain. Okay, good. Do you have examples of things that have to be handled in user space and can't be uh, handled by BPF? 
Uh, for example, let me see. Uh, I give you an example of open, right? So open has to be handled in user space because open will instruct the driver based on some parameters that will be inserted in the map, right? So open cannot be handled uh, in, uh, in kernel, right? And then, some, and then uh, in this example where I show how metadata caching works, so the first one, get attribute, it's uh, looking the cache, so it's consuming the cache. Uh, the other one is actually doing the invalidation because you're caching, you just wanna make sure there's no stale data. So you need to invalidate as well. So if there's a set attribute, you need to, you need to invalidate and then go back to user space. So this is another example where you would go back to user space. Okay, no, just. This was it. Last question. Sure. When do we see the code? <laughs> and where do we see the code? Good question. With little help from Google, pretty soon. <laughs> did you um, look at what's did you look at what's uh, changed in Q? Um, sorry. Did you look at what's changed in Q yet? The Q AOSP release? Because maybe that. Maybe Android Q. Android Q. Oh, no, I haven't. No. Okay, because ma maybe that would link in what you were saying that maybe some of these things yeah. weren't exposed before then. I don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not towing the line on the version name change. Yes, if something already exists, uh, we can reuse that. Yeah, no need for new code. I think those parts were developed in AOSP all along, so I think it's been available for many months now. Uh, so I think we still have some time, right? If, there are, if don't have any questions, I would like to point out another example. Um, so this is an example where, so I give you uh, three cases, uh, actually two cases, this is the third one. So use cases uh, with ext4 that you can, you can do. So you can have direct IO pass through to lower file system. You can have custom metadata caching in the kernel and you can enforce permission checks in the kernel. So this is again eBPF code. So um, you, can, you can insert this code in the kernel and uh, be execute that as part of, you know, let's say lookup operation or um, uh, get attribute operation if needed. Uh, two questions. Have you tried upstreaming the BPF parts into the fuse kernel? Uh, no, I haven't tried. I've released the kernel code, uh, but uh, the, so I did not get a chance to test with uh, meltdown patches. So that's something that I need to do. Okay. And then uh, try upstreaming it. Because meltdown will change the equation. One of the things we're considering is also read use cases. Uh, whether it's, does it work where it's either always pass through or always an up call? Is there uh, a way today, or do you have any ideas around if you can so do for, something about that? For example, if you insert your custom read extension in the kernel, for example, this one, uh -huh. uh, if you want always pass through, you can just say up call always, replace it with up call, or you could have some custom check, you know, based on UID, GID, PID, you know, something else that will either so conditionally generate up call or pass through. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other question? Three times. Mm. I think, uh, yeah. All right, then. Thank you so much. Thank you.
No? <laughs> it works. <laughs> What new slide template? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I wanted to cover uh, what we've been doing with VPPF for networking in Android. Um, and uh, I joined the team only about a year ago. I was working on networking on servers before that. So a lot of this work was actually done by my current manager, Lorenzo, and Chenbo. Um, and uh, uh, they did all the work for P with most of the implementation by Chenbo and Lorenzo doing the reviews. And for Q it was half and half. And going forward it's going to be probably mostly me. Um, so why VPF? Um, there's a bunch of reasons. Um, getting rid of custom Android kernel patches is probably the largest one. So anything we can move into VPF is great for long-term maintainability. Um, there's also just stuff where we can actually get performance improvements by moving out of user space and into eBPF. Um, there's also actually a lot more configurability that can be accomplished with eBPF. Um, capabilities, for example, are pretty limited in what you can accomplish with them. There's a small number of them. You can't dynamically grant them to processes, only when you start the process, um, that sort of stuff. Um, kernel upgrades um, are a huge problem. Um, you can't really upgrade devices in the field. Um, we can't, um, you can upgrade eBPF programs basically, but you can't upgrade kernels, right? So if we can move stuff into the eBPF, then we can uh, rev it with the platform. Um, and uh, well, uh, the reason I moved to the team was because I like eBPF and I wanted to work on this, so. <laughs> Um, so this is a quick uh, rundown of what we did in Android P. Um, this was actually presented at LPC two years ago, so I only have one slide on this. Um, and the primary thing we did was we got rid of the XDQ tag uh, UID extension, uh, which was a custom IP tables um, piece of code, and it was actually a constant source of problems because every time the upstream kernel changed something, we would end up with all sorts of deadlocks and bugs and stuff not working, and, and then we'd have to spend time debugging it. So uh, uh, Chenbo moved all of that into uh, eBPF code. And in Q, um, on supported devices, we no longer use the QTAC UID uh, extension. And we even reverted the code out of the kernel. So uh, it's faster, it's cleaner, and we hopefully won't have to touch it ever again because it'll just keep on working. Um, so those are the links to the slides from two years ago. Um, so what we did in Q, uh, we did basically two things. Uh, one was there was a, another custom kernel patch called Paranoid Android, which did um, basically it was a way to prevent apps from having access to sockets. And this was switched um, for the 414 plus kernel to use eBPF hooks at socket creation time to do uh, permission checks um, at that point in time based on uh, the UID. Um, and uh, the other thing we did was we had a, a user space daemon uh, that enables the phone to support v4 applications on a v6 only cellular connection. And in order to do this, it has to do basically translate IPv6 packets into IPv4 packets and translate IPv4 packets into IPv6 packets. Um, applications that actually support IPv6 will uh, get tricked by DNS into using IPv6 even to talk to IPv4 destinations. But applications that don't support IPv6 will keep on using IPv4. Applications that use v4 literals will keep on using IPv4. And if you tether a phone, anything that is being tethered over v4 over a v6 uplink will also go through this code. So there was this daemon, and it was slow, really slow. and. Uh, we replaced it um, in one direction only, and only for the most simple of cases, um, with eBPF code. So we actually still run the daemon, but all the simple cases, so TCP and UDP that isn't fragmented and is coming from the cellular uplink, um, is uh, handled by eBPF and no longer hits the daemon. 
Um, and that was a huge win. It's uh, depending on how you run the benchmark numbers, um, potentially the improvement is 400x. Um, but that's, that's th my personal belief is that there's bugs in the user space daemon that we have to fix. <laughs> so I don't think it's quite that good, but well, still, 400x is, improvement, is, is pretty good. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of interesting problems um, working with eBPF and Android. Uh, we don't have the benefit of, of being you know, on the newest kernel all the time. So there's all sorts of crazy things like you make a change to a BPF map that doesn't immediately take effect um, because of multi-threaded systems and all sorts of scheduler problems. So if you, if you want to make sure that the, the new BPF code is using the new BPF map, um, then you actually need to make sure that a, that a kernel RCU grace period has, has uh, expired. And there's actually no way to do that from user space. So we were scratching our heads for a long time how to do this on the 4.9 kernel. And we discovered that if you create uh, an AF key socket and then close it, then closing the socket forces an RCU synchronization event to take place. <laughs> That's part of the cleanup code path. So that's just terrible hack, but it works. Um, <laughs> uh, well, the, uh, on, on newer upstream kernels, there actually is a way to force the synchronization with an explicit API. Yeah, it's just not there in 4.9. Um, and what we would like to do, so, so everything I've been talking up till now is available in queue. It's all published in AOSP, and there'll be links to the code later on. Now this is kind of like what we would like to do in R. Um, so the IPv6 translation, uh, it was done only for the simplest cases and only on receive. Um, we would like to handle all the more complex cases, fragmented packets, ICMP datagrams, and we would like to hand mit, uh, handle the transmit side as well. There just wasn't enough time to do that. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of problems here. Stuff like, for example, the standard BPF translator for v6 to v4 assumes that v6 is 40 bytes and v4 is 20 bytes of headers, but it turns out that a v4 fragment is 20 bytes, but a v6 fragment is 48 bytes. So there's this eight bytes that you kind of have to handle correctly, and there's no support for that in 4.9. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, um, we are hoping to do something to improve tethering um, as well. Um, there's uh, it's, it's hard to say what, what exactly the current problems are with tethering. Um, some people think that it's a very complex network setup because of the fact that we support multiple uplinks and uh, we have a very complex uh, routing setup and a very complex IP table setup as a result of this. And other people th uh, think that it's mostly just problems in the network drivers where they're not terribly optimized and that a lot of fixes could be done there. Um, we shall see. Um, my personal belief is that a lot of the problems are coming from the complex setup and that by moving to packet forwarding and BPF, we can hopefully at least eliminate those bottlenecks. Um, but we'll see. Um, I was hoping that we would try to use XDP, but based on some discussions um, earlier today in the networking track, it sounds like not this year. <laughs> um, it sounds like it's super, super complex. Um, and we still need to enable the JIT um, because apparently we're not using it. Um, so challenges. Um, security is a challenge um, because, well, do you want to load untrusted BPF? Do you want to dynamically generate BPF? Do you only want to load eBPF from a read-only partition, from DM Verity, et cetera, et cetera? So a lot of thought has been going into that. And sometimes you need crazy workarounds like put booleans in maps so that you can dynamically choose the code path instead of just load a different program or dynamically compile the program. Um, another thing that keeps on showing up is uh, stuff relating to uh, filtering netlink messages. Um, the kernel generates a netlink response. Uh, upstream considers the entire content of that message to be um, open, uh, like like freely available to everybody on the machine, and that might include stuff that we would consider to be privacy conscious, like a MAC address or something. 
Um, so you may want to f uh, parse that out, and maybe we can use eBPF to somehow filter out Netlink messages. It sounds very difficult to do. We'll see what happens. Um, a constant source of trouble is trying to make all this stuff work on old kernels because there's all this cool stuff in you know kernels that are three years newer. <laughs> um, and another problem is there's a lot of different hardware out there. There's a lot of different kernels on this. They have a lot of different configuration options that are, have a lot of different backboards and patches. And making sure everything works and testing is really, really, really hard. Um, development is actually easiest in a VM, um, which is sad. Um, and this is pretty much my final slide. Um, as a result of all this, um, the, the delta uh, between the Android common kernel as regards to networking and the upstream Linux kernel uh, is down to five patches. Um, one of them is one line, one of them is two lines, <laughs> and three of them are more complex. Um, and I think we have a plan for how to eliminate another one or maybe one and a half of them. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice. Um, unfortunately, this is only the Android common kernel. Uh, there are still a lot of networking patches that are in device-specific kernels. So we, we still have to figure out what to do with all that stuff and how much of it we can, uh, we can upstream. And upstream keeps on changing stuff. And uh, we have networking tests. And they like every time, something new fails. So chasing upstream, sometimes it's our tests that are broken. Sometimes it's something that upstream broke. Sometimes it's bad assumptions somewhere else. It's, it's painful. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And uh, questions? Got it. Um, so you mentioned testing, and testing is quite complex. How do we help you with that? Um, when you say you, you are, you're, you're from Lenaro. Um, I don't entirely know how to answer that question. I know that uh, we've been trying to make sure that we run the networking test suite against all the versions of the common kernel out there, and that we run um, Android, the OS, against every version of that kernel, so that we run the Q user space against the 4.9p kernel, that we run the Q user space against the 4.9q kernel, et cetera, um, that we run the networking test on all those kernels, that we run it on ARM, that we run it on x86, that we run 64-bit user space on 64-bit kernels, 32-bit user space on 64-bit kernels, 32-bit user space on 32-bit kernels. Um, <laughs> one of the patches that we actually have, the, the, the two-line patch, is actually deleting checks from the kernel in order to allow 32 on 64 to work. So there's a lot of that. Um, I'm not entirely sure where uh, the continu continuous integration tests that, that Lenaro runs could fit into this, but I'm sure something could be done. Um, sure, yeah. I'm, I'm really hoping that the, the, the Cuttlefish and GKI initiatives will yeah. reduce the, the complexity. Um, th I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it helps. Is your, at least your test cases, are they at least open? They're in the VTF. So you, it runs them all in Minecraft. Okay. Right. So, so the tests are all there in VTS. Um, unfortunately, um, right now, all the virtualization environments don't actually really have networking support in them. Um, we don't have v6 in the virtualization environment. Um, we don't have, like, like, basically, there are no real tests. Like, at the end of the day, you run the tests by flashing a device and taking it out into the field and walking around and finding access points and cellular networks and stuff <laughs> like that. Captive portals and all sorts of stuff like that. So, yeah. A lot of work to be done there. Oh, I had a question oh, about the netlink routing. Do you have any thoughts on how do we solve that problem? I know you, the, you know the problem. The problem is basically just for everybody. Uh, the netlink broadcast as they come to user space, Android has two native demons that listen to them. One is uEvent and the other is Healthy. Healthy is the thing that monitors battery, uh, but, but it basically e with an e wake up because it has to, because your device can, battery can die while the device is suspended. So when the battery state changes, whether it's temperature or battery state, we want to make sure Healthy knows about it so it can take action in case the battery is critical or the temperature is dangerous. So. But the problem because of that e wake up happens is when the device is being suspended, 
there are CPU hot plug events that gets created and sent to broadcast over U event, um, uh, Netlink broadcast, and those are seen by healthy because it's and then you wake up user space, it tries to go down into suspend again and again the CPU shut down and the cycle continues. Uh, so basically that breaks suspend pretty much for us. It only happened on x86 and it happens as the code changes upstream because this was new. We didn't, this event or this U event wasn't there before. So we were looking for a solution where the user space can tell the kernel to filter U events and that's probably what you meant there. Yeah, yeah I, I, that, that was on, on one of the slides. I don't have I don't have a good, good answer for this. I'm really actually scared of filtering uh, Netlink in eBPF. Netlink is not you know, a statically formatted protocol, so it's it basically requires loops, and that's not nice. Okay, so next up we're gonna talk about LKFT, and LKFT is short for Linux Kernel Functional Test. Um, emphasis on Linux. Um, so there's sort of two aspects of this. So let's talk about LKFT as a, as a system first. So what it is is a lab. You've got a number of test targets, and matter of fact, it can be a federated system, so it's one of those things where not all of the lab and hardware has to be on site in Lenaro. It can be distributed all across companies, just like kernel CI or anything like that. And it is coordinated such that you know, you've got a build system with Jenkins, it, you have a dispatch system with Lava, and so ultimately it's, Lava is working with the devices that are under test, so you get a new kernel that pops in through a branch, you have to build that, you have to push that out to the devices, you have to make sure that in the case of Android devices, that you have user space that then is paired with the device, and then you have to push out what it is that you're ultimately going to be running on the device. So in the case of, of course, Android, um, depending on what your user space is, you might be running a different version of CTS and BTS, and so you have to make sure you get all that right. And then you end up with a whole bunch of data at the end that you've got to go and ultimately analyze. Or hopefully it's as simple as everything just passed, so no regressions, we move on. So when in the case of Linux kernel functional test, our main goal is, is we're looking for regressions in the kernel. So as an LTS moves forward or as mainline goes forward, if we have something that breaks, we want to catch it as early as possible, get the people involved that own that code, and ultimately present them with either the problem or as much as a debug problem as possible, or even better sometimes in case we can hand them a patch and say, look, by the way, here's how we get, you know, managed to get bisected, and this was the, the, what needs to happen. So. Um, now that we've been kind of doing this for about two years now, um, in the case of an just the Android tests only, we've run our tests, uh, we run about 90 million tests all total. However, this chart actually exposes an interesting piece of the dynamic of LKFT, and that's, there's really, there's two universes here. And that's why I was stressing Linux kernel functional testing, because when, like Greg, KH releases a new stable RC, what happens is, is that kicks off a whole bunch of testing that occurs with Linux as the OS that's under test. And then ultimately what happens, because Android Common is a little bit behind LTS, is as then when those patches get landed and everything gets accepted in the released LTS, it makes it into Android Common. And that's when the Android testing happens. So, if you pull in the testing that uh, Dan's team does for the Linux hosted stuff, that's another 60 million tests that have been run. So what I really wanna stress here is, is that we kinda have these wa this waterfall model where as things flow in through Linux NASC, they get merged, they ended up in mainline, and then ultimately you have an LTS that gets released, then LTS goes through its own lifetime cycle, and of course that's um, being followed very closely in Android Common, and then you end up in a sock tree, which ends up at a vendor, which then ultimately ends up in a phone. You know, this is a pretty long cycle. Um, and something that we really, really wanna compress down as much as possible, because ultimately what I would love to be able to do is that when Mainline releases something new or an LTS releases something new, that I can 
run Android on that kernel and report status to Greg or to Linus or anything like that when something regresses. And so um, Samit here is going to have a, uh, something that he, he can at least hold up in the air, and that is we've got a POCO F1 that's booting Android with mainline. And so, you know, conceptually we want to do it with, with more devices, because the thing is, this is not just the POCO F1, it's also the Pixel X3 as well. And then you can run CTS on that, you can run VTS on it. So now that 90 million amount of tests that we run can suddenly be, um, you know, something of value to the, you know, main Linux kernel community as opposed to, oh, well, you know, you couldn't give us the feedback that something broke because we've already done our release. So that's, that's really something that we're, we're really trying to, to push and I think also something where, you know, there's major, major props to be given to the Google kernel team in particular for getting their code upstream so that we can boot devices with a mainline kernel. Okay, so don't read too much into the title of the slide because I don't want to take something, anything away from boot testing in general. Boot testing is good, but that's not the only kind of testing that's important. This is where functional testing comes in, and this is, you know, like, for instance, we were just talking about eBPF, you know, as an example of it's a very complex thing to test. Well, ultimately, if you want to test a very complex thing, you need to have a, have a very complex test suite to run against it so that you can look for regressions. So, you know, in my wonderful world, I would love to be able to find those kinds of problems, which is kind of why I asked the question that I did. You know, how do we make that kind of thing better so that we can have quicker uh, feedback loops? So for us, when we're testing Android, uh, what we do is we do, of course, run VT VTS, um, which has K self-test and LTP in it. In our case, though, what we'll do is, is we'll update LTP so that it's not what was in the release version of UTS. We try to have um, the latest, greatest LTP on that, which in case um, Sandeep here in the front row, I've got to give major thanks for actually making that kind of thing possible. And then we also run CTS, but we just run a cut down version of that, which you know kind of pokes and prods and tickles various parts of the kernel so that it does interesting things like networking and you know Bluetooth and camera and all those kinds of things. But moving beyond that, you know, those are all tests where the, they're all pass-fail. But there's other kinds of testing which is interesting too. So we have boards in our lab that have energy probes on them. So we're measuring watts and joules. And so what we can do with the energy aware scheduler over time is, is we can watch for trends. And that is, is as patches are coming into LTS, is your energy going up or is your energy usage going down. Obviously, we all like to be using less energy, especially in a consumer device. So this gives us another way to detect a regression in a kernel, which isn't something that's necessarily functional. It's just a use of more energy. So we can go back to the EAS maintainers and say, oh, by the way, the, here's the patch that came in. Something happened. You know, you take it from here. Um, but it isn't just you know, that's not the only thing that you can do. You can also take advantage of the chameleon board. And so this is something we've started to pull into our lab. And so what the chameleon board can do is it can capture video and sound. So it, it you know, literally is able to act like a LCD panel, I guess is kind of a, a good way of explaining to it. So you can go in and you can probe and say, okay, it picks a lot of particular XY coordinate. What value is it? Is it what you would expect? So if you're playing back video or a camera or anything like that, you can, you know, very quickly start to you know, validate before L2 in ways that it hasn't been done before. You can do playback and with, you know, other test suites that you use professional video, that kind of stuff, and that's particularly exciting. Um, another test suite I think is really interesting is SynthMark, which is something that Phil Burke is doing at Google. Um, so this is all about, um, you know, it's, it's an audio, it's a vir virtualized environment, so it doesn't actually need the chameleon board, but it is testing workloads and seeing how efficient is sound, and it's also looking for latencies and things like that, so good stuff. So, you know, my, my impassioned plea here is, is that, you know, we shouldn't be just thinking of functional testing as pass-fail type stuff. It, ca it can and it should vol evolve into more complicated tests for one thing, and it can be, we should be also be thinking in things like EAS as well, where you're not just looking at something that, again, is a pass-fail, but it's, you know, watts and joules. How are we doing for time? Six minutes, 45. Well, this is where I like to get into the questions because, as I recall, this should be my last slide. Um, so I think one of the general questions I've got for the audience is, is where else should we be putting time and effort into validating kernels as they're evolving through either LTS or with mainline? And back there. Yeah, I'm wondering about the, uh, the FGPU. Who are you testing that, if you are? With, with IGT? 
Yeah, with IGT you could test some, but I guess you want to run the EKP, so the GLDS tool. Yeah, so at, the, at this point we're not doing a lot with the graphics stack, um, save what, you know, for what's in uh, CTS. Uh, we've started to, you know, poke and prod on the on IGT. Of course, you know, we're in the ARM universe primarily for all our devices, and there's a lot of IGT, which is Intel specific. Um, but you know, this is an area where we see that there could be a lot of improvement. Um, we do see some, you know, some things that we could do with the Mesa and DRM communities. Um, that, that's you know, that's just stuff that we've we've thought about. We haven't really taken any action on it as of yet. <laughs> um, would you find useful a tool that given to um, bug reports or you know K message dumps or whatever uh, that are bad in some way uh, can identify the badness relative to, to, to the to the two to each other and point it out relative to a known good trace? Yes. Okay. It's a loaded, <laughs> it's a pointed question it's because we have such a tool in-house uh, at Google. We use it for bug reports, broad bug reports for all of Android. And um, we, we have this very painful need to uh, answer the question due to the fragmentation that we're all dealing with uh, of, hey, there's, there's a bug in this BSP by an SOC provider. Does it also exist in AOSP? That is, was it introduced by AOSP, which acts as the upstream for all of Android, uh, or downstream of it? And so that might be useful for the kernel. We could talk. That would be spectacular, because we save all of the logs, but we're not doing any sort of post-processing okay. them after the fact. So yeah, I, that would be something I think we could take advantage of. OK. So if you don't use. If hi, if you don't use all of the debugging tools, then that may be an obvious kind of way for evolution. Because what's lots of tests and efforts do they run tests, but the tests actually corrupt memory, leak memory, deadlock, and that's all considered as good and passing. So yeah, and there yeah. there are those kinds of tests where they'll crash the kernel, and our environment can recover from that, and you know go on to the next test and things like that. So that's you know if if there are more of those kinds of tests, um, we would, you know, it, and they're not integrated with like LTP, that's a great place to put them. I, I mean possible, that or kind of debugging tools like KSN, log Oh, up, yeah, KSN, AM, sure. KMM leak, fold injection, and, you know, those yeah, are about Yeah, that's a really good the, class of stuff. And so, like, yeah, right now we're not taking advantage of that. So, like, um, you know, for so instance, go ahead. You're, then you're missing lots and lots of bugs, and in particular security bugs and stability bugs. I'm going to ask Dimitri's follow-up question. So how does he get you to do that? So in many ways, I think if we were to start to do that, what we have to do is we have to change our approach to how we config the system um, and how we build the system as well. And you know, clearly, we need to think about how to do that in an effective way, because um, that will explode the number of builds that we would have, and that would also explode the number of tests that we would we would have to be running. Um, but it, you know, this is all supposed to be testing at scale anyway. So adding more capacity to be able to do it, I think, is is something that's good. So very good suggestion. I had one more question. If somebody had a test or test framework suggestion for you, how do they contact? Um, so I think probably the simplest thing to do is email me. So that's tom.gall at lenaro.org. Um, or get a hold of me after the session. Or actually, Dan's another great person to get a hold of as well. Um, you know, so in, you know, in the case where you know, I care more about Android, Dan cares more about Linux. But you know, we wanted to make sure that we, we cover all the possibilities. Are your, email, are your emails in the slide deck so they can discover them? I did not add them. I will do that and we'll send add you an them update. Before we post. So we'll, when it's posted, they'll yeah. be there. I'll, I'm going to show that we do that, yes. And I think the debug tools is in your backlog, right? Um, it, 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 it is. It yeah. is, yeah. So it's, it's not like they've been ignoring that case. It's in the backlog, and it's in plan. It just hasn't <coughs> happened yet. 
Okay. G A L L. Yeah. Sorry. Good eyes. Not <laughs> not obvious spelling. Yeah. I was hoping I could see it correctly. <laughs> Way to go, Rob. All right, anything else? All right, thanks everyone. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Suren Bagdasarian. I work in the Android uh, systems team. I'll present some of the ideas we are working on um, to uh, better handle memory pressure on Android systems. So what's wrong with this picture is this orange part basically where, um, which represents the RSS of the cached applications. And as you can see, a lot of memory is used by cached applications, which is basically uh, mostly idle. And um, so we want to find ways to use that memory more, more useful. Um, so um, to use that for foreground or more important applications uh, while not killing the background ones which are using, um, which, which owns that memory, but however it's being idle. Um, so the solution is uh, proactively re reclaim uh, that memory which uh, is not uh, being used and we know uh, that it's not going to be used for in the near future. And that can be done by, um, what we do is basically we implement a, a process M advice uh, syscall. Uh, it's a working progress. Uh, and it also we also add uh, two uh, advice options which are already in the MM uh, tree. Uh, they are M advice code and M advice page out. Um, and I'll explain more in details what they are doing. Um, as a result, we are getting 15% um, less kills on the dog food population, basically running this with real, uh, with internal users, and 30% uh, less kills on uh, stress tests. And we don't get uh, a big penalty on basically restarting or unpacking the compacted applications because we are using ZRAM and it's much faster than restarting the application um, from, from the scratch. So more details on process M advice. Uh, it's a syscall basically which allows us to give a memory advice to about the pro VMAs of a process uh, of a different process. And the idea is that system management uh, software can give that, um, which knows that a particular process went in the background, it has been there for a while, and we have a pretty good idea that it's not gonna be reused anytime soon. We can tell um, kernel, we can hint kernel that uh, pages for this uh, process can be reclaimed. And we use M advice code to deactivate pages. And in our case, we use that for file backed pages because as a result of the experimenting, we found out that if we reclaim file backed pages, then if we made a mistake and we have to bring them back, it's the cost is too steep. So instead of reclaiming them, we are deactivating them so that they can be reclaimed faster in case memory pressure happens. And uh, M advice page out is um, another advice which uh, reclaims the pages. And uh, we use that for uh, anonymous pages to swap them out. Um, so that's about the first idea of compacting applications. The uh, second idea I want to present is uh, improvements to LMKD kill strategy. Uh, the previous one was looking only at the uh, pre-memory levels and also at the uh, file-back uh, file page cache size. And uh, I'm working on the new strategy which also looks at the zone watermark breaches, uh, swap utilization, and uh, working set refaults uh, to identify uh, file-backed uh, uh, page cache thrashing. And advantage is uh, the new kill strategy works well for both kind of devices, high performance and low memory devices, which was not the case with the old strategy. We had two different strategies uh, to kill on those devices. Uh, we also get decreased number of tunables, um, so it's easier to tune, and we also get uh, favorable results. So on high-end devices, we get 
25% less kills with 15% uh, up launch time improvements because we get less cold starts as a result of less kills. And on low, end, uh, uh, low memory devices, uh, we get the only case when we get regression of five to six percent is on very large uh, working set sizes where <coughs> basically previous uh, strategy which was basically kill whenever you see a hint of memory pressure um, works better because um, working set size is so big that you have to kill anyway. So basically a dumb decision to kill as soon as possible was is winning in that case. And we're looking at uh, additional heuristics to identify those cases where uh, we can make that decision faster. So basically when working set is too, too big, either limit that working set by killing pre uh, uh, preemptively or um, killing faster, basically, or deciding to kill faster. Uh, those are the new tunables. Uh, it's basically the thresholds for uh, PSI stall, for partial and complete PSI stalls, uh, thresholds for uh, free swap levels, and uh, thresholds for uh, thrashing and thrashing uh, decay. All right, and the last idea I want to present is uh, tracking processes using PDFDs. Uh, PDFDs are the new features that was introduced in the latest kernels, and um, the problem we are tackling here is uh, the PID reuse. So occasionally, not pretty rare occasion, uh, we, s uh, we observe on Android systems that uh, PIDs gets, gets reused. So the scenario is process gets registered with, uh, with uh, LMKD using its PID, then it crashes for some reason and LMKD doesn't have any clue about the fact that this process crashed. Uh, then after a while, system can reuse that uh, PID if there's an overflow of PIDs basically. It reuses the PID for a different process and then memory pressure happens, LMKD tries to kill that PID and it kills the wrong process, the new one, thinking that it's original one. And that new, um, new process might be a very important one. So even though it's a very rare occasion, it's, uh, it can be devastating for the user experience. Something very important might crash. So the solution to this problem is uh, using the PDFDs. And the trick is basically PDFDs don't get reused until all the users close that file descriptor. So if LMKD opens the uh, file descriptor to a process, then it's not gonna be reused until um, basically LMKD closes it. Um, that was the three main ideas I wanted to present. Uh, all of them are working progress. Um, the application compaction partially is already in the MM tree. Uh, partially we are still, um, the, we didn't upstream the process M device syscall yet. Um, the other two are purely user space changes. All the kernel uh, space changes are already upstream. So uh, those are also under review. Questions? Um, PDFD, uh, isn't it easier to connect debugger D to LMKD because debugger D knows when that process dies and it can tell LMKD that this happened? So this is that you can address that issue on legacy devices this way too because that's been the case for many years. Until, and PDFD is probably the, a better way to fix it, but you have a backstop way to do that too. Yeah, it's a medication for kind of uh, devices which, with, which don't have PDFD support. Um, yeah, it can be done. Um, it's a patch basically, but uh, going forward, we want a real solution where with the kernel support, and that's why uh, we basically work on, on that. But um, yeah we can look into also additional support for legacy devices. Oh, I just have a question. Do you know how many times the PID reuse actually ob was observed? Uh, well, I can tell about my experience. I've, I've got like one bug um, uh, in two or three months, which after, and it's very painful to uh, debug that problem because uh, process gets killed, that process had um score which should have never been killed, and uh, yet it still gets killed. And it's very difficult to prove that this is actually the reason because 
uh, PID reuse happens after a very long time, so you don't get those traces or logs. That's from I wanted to move back so immediately, so you start getting this validator hypothesis. Sorry? That's why the <laughs> that's why the backstop is u useful for you because mm -hmm. it can validate your hypothesis. Yeah, and you'll stop getting these annoying <laughs> bug reports or bugs assigned to you. Yeah, uh, well, we validated that by adding some of the additional checks to, for this case, basically, but they are not the real solution. The real solution is actually being able to track that. Um, completely. Uh, a slightly unrelated question. Have you ever considered using low memory killer to um, basically reclaim graphic buffers like ion, ashmem, DMA buff? Uh, yeah, we are actually, Sandeep is working on standardizing the ion <laughs> 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 API. So <laughs> as soon as we have a standard way to look at the ion usage, um, so we definitely are going to um, use that knowledge in LMKD because a lot of memory, and it's, it's a big uh, share of memory being used by applications in ION, and we we don't have a clear way right now to specify to point out which application is using it. Okay, um, I think you could also partially do that through Gralic. We're going to start tracking who allocated the buffer and who has references on the buffer, so you'd be able to identify if the foreground process has it. Yeah, um, yeah. but it'd be really nice to have this because right now an app can crash Android any app just by allocating buffers until the device crashes. Yeah, yeah that's definitely something we're going to look into. Yeah. That, becomes that becomes relevant for ION and also, I guess, what Sumit's going to talk in the DMA buff discussion as well, because we need that for tracking all the memory in all heaps, basically. Any more questions? Uh, when are we going to fix the ion issue? <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, okay, next up is Sumit. Well, we're just going to wait till six uh, start just in case some people <coughs> come in. So Alex there, he was very explicit about his instructions. You need to hold it like that, All right? Not like that, like that. Not too close. Just like. Yeah. Okay. One, two, one, two. Is that one? Like this. One, two. We're good. All right. If you have to.
Are you counting seconds? Yeah, I'm just saying an extra 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm just uh, filling in for John, who couldn't be here. This talk is basically going to be about uh, our recent efforts around ion upstreaming uh, that uh, Linaro has been doing with Alistair Davis, uh, I think, from TI, um, and uh, a few others. Uh, first up, I think I'd just like to thank Laura, because she's been coming up here, I think, for the past six years or so. <laughs> and we've been talking about how can we do the IND staging. She's done a lot of good work and maintenance, so thank you, Laura. Um, so there are a few issues with ION, I guess. The, uh, probably the kind of issues, yeah, Sandeep, you can, you can just kill me later on. So the, the kind of issues that uh, have been there were around, uh, it's, it's been trying to do too many things in one interface, so constraint solving, uh, trying to do uh, uh, cache handling that was also uh, tried to be enforced on vendors so they couldn't get it wrong. Uh, it had a few, it, it tried to provide a flexible interface for vendors, but it was like a really poorly defined um, interface uh, for, for custom heap flags. It also tried to, so because of that, vendors actually hacked uh, shared caching logic in common code, and uh, that made it very hard to have single source with multiple different heaps in them. Uh, vendor heaps. So as part of um, ion upstreaming efforts, uh, DMA API correctness was done, but it sort of hurt performance, and uh, that just meant that a lot of vendors actually reverted the changes that were made by Laura, and, and uh, we have many users where 4.9 ion is used with 4.14 plus kernels. So uh, to try and, uh, so what we tried to do was to just focus on one feature from ION, which is basically standardizing the user land allocation interface for different types of memories. Um, the good thing is that each uh, heap driver has its own uh, CARDIV, and so uh, there is one allocation IOCTL, and then enumeration is based on uh, heap names. Um, because each driver is its own DMF exporter. There's no need to modify the core part of the custom heaps. Uh, cache maintenance and everything else is left to the heap driver, which is uh, its own DMF of exporter. Uh, we have tried to provide some helper functions that allow uh, avoiding duplication while providing some flexibility for the users. Um, we are definitely not planning to solve every crazy case, uh, crazy use case that can come in. Um, for example, we know that there are some dynamic secure heap implementations that uh, need user to pass magic cookies to specify which dynamic security domain that you're trying to allocate from and so on. So we, we're definitely not gonna try to attempt that. Um, you can still write your own DMF of exporter driver or a custom heap. Uh, um, and vendors, the request is that once this is uh, upstream, I mean, you should just move to move your iron core to this. So this is this is all John. Uh, uh, as part of DMABF buff upstream uh, heap upstream effort, we have uh, also provided two example heaps that are the system and the CMA. So while uh, while uh, posting those for review, actually. Christoph Helwig gave a, a good amount of feedback around these. Uh, it's basically, he had concerns around allowing CPU mapping, the KMAP, VMAP, and MAP uh, to exist in parallel with device mappings, and his concern was that they were easy to misuse and could provide inconsistent data. But actually, the uh, feedback doesn't seem to be around the heaps interface themselves, but around the system and CMA heap uh, exporters, basically trying to establish what are the rules of DMA buff APIs using these uh, uh, allocated DMA buffs. So it looks like a reasonable concern. I mean, uh, this can be dangerous. Should we allow people to uh, have these foot guns? So, but on the graphic side, and I, I had to write down the name of the movie. It's, it's from a movie called Planet Terror. <laughs> and people just get probably, they, they saw the movie and they got pretty excited about what they can do, uh, and so, uh, Graphics needs flexible solutions, of course, and there, there is an absolute need for uh, performance solutions. 
So uh, what happens is it's more like let me have my performance and I'll take care of the side effects or what I mean things don't go wrong. Whereas the for for the other users of API, the uh, the answer is probably uh, if they do bad things, they get bad results. So uh, it's it's a valid concern uh, of of trying to. Uh, um, I mean, how do we enforce things around um, these? These. Uh. So um, I think we need to raise the concern for uh, something that we at least need to document better. So um, I think Daniel Better is here. Yes. So when we when we designed uh, the initial DMA buff API and the documentation that we did, it had a, a really cool possibility that you could have the um, delayed allocation possible, so you could prob potentially you could do uh, constraint solving after allowing different devices to attach, and then do allocation based on the first map. But it's remained like an elusive uh, uh, implementation. We don't have any upstream drivers that implement that. On the other hand, because the feature is available, there are a lot of people that think it's it's an actual feature and is available for people to use. So that's something we probably need to um, uh, get sorted. Uh, then the um, there is some confusion also around the usage barriers. So the CPU begin and then the end access, device map and unmap are thought of as exclusive usage barriers. But uh, the core framework doesn't actually mandate, it doesn't actually do it. It's left for the exporters to handle. So probably the question is wh how should we either document or enforce the uh, usage barriers around. Uh, with the advent of the implicit uh, uh, fences, the rules seem to have been uh, loosened a little bit. So now it's probably the bracketing is around CPU begin and access and fence fate and signal. Uh, then also we, we do need to talk about I mean, explicit, explicit signaling makes it feel like uh, implicit ownership signaling rules might have lost their meaning. So uh, nothing seems to enforce the correctness with implicit methods when it comes to uh, cache management. Uh, so probably the question here is, uh, do we, I mean, there are use cases that exist where multiple device maps are used in parallel and then there's manual cache cleaning and signaling that happens with fences. So probably one question is, do we want to enforce exclusion between VMAP and map kmap and map for device? Or if yes, then there is a concern that GL has some use cases where one buffer can be accessed at the same time by device and CPU carefully. So that's, that's another. So I, I think one topic for discussion is how do we really sanely address Christoph's feedback? I mean, Without limiting some of these usage models, how do we enforce these um, um, usage barriers? I guess some rules would help. Uh, so I'll probably go to the next slide. Because without those rules, I think uh, the optimizations will become limited due to lack of uh, ability to assert correctness. Um, OK, around the CMO. Uh, so the idea is trying to reduce overhead of DMA map and map SG on every device map and map. So cache flushing overhead of DMA map SG is significant. I mean, if you do map and map every device, every frame, it's just not going to hold up. Um, this issue actually uh, was visible more after the uh, 4.12 ion DMA APIs fixes that we did for, for correctness. But then, because it was not performant, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be fast. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the vendors wanted to do their own hacks, and they just reverted ion to 4.9, had uncached buffers, whatever. Uh, then some in kernel DMA buff exporters also cheat by uh, doing DMA buff do DMA map SG on attach and only when direction changes. So uh, Christian Koenigs actually he had a submitter patch which made the cache SGT mapping flag, uh, so it allowed to be made generic. But that really doesn't sort of solve the problem. Um, very often, buffer is never touched by the CPU, so can we try to do lazy flushing only when you ownership or usage changes? That's another question. But probably to do that, you we need to have some sort of exclusive device CPU mapping. So it 
goes back to it. There are just two topics I want to very quickly touch upon, which is uh, partial cache and validation on DMA buffs that Alistair discussed with John. Uh, so they had an idea around uh, proposing range flushes, which is basically DMA clean range or DMA flush range. But I think we need a clear articulation of the need what, of the community as to what is required and then definitely an upstream user of the code. And very quick shout out to, this is just FYI, but kernel graphics buffers is also something that uh, John had discussed with Marisa and Alistair and uh, the idea is to add buffers with metadata. And my question around here is, I mean, are gem buffers the right answer? Probably it depends on the definition of metadata, but okay, open. Oh, I just had a comment. The partial cache flush and invalidate is a real thing and apparently is a performance optimization. I just wanted to put it out there. Okay. So it's already in kernel? I didn't know that. It's <laughs> it's probably not in upstream kernel, but we've seen it. It's You'll see it in USPI on, for example, today. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's something that it's something that, that, that vendors need. There are use cases yes. for it. So but that's that's why probably that's the forum that we really need to right, right. discuss it right here and see if there are any real objections to yeah. trying to. Yeah, because, be, because it also opens all can of worms because the APIs that you need in order to actually do partial cache flush are also not even exported to any of the drivers too. So then that's going to open up more problems. Yeah. So okay, that was, that was, I think, the last slide, yeah. I also had one more, there's nobody. Oh, yeah. the user space API for the DMA buff heaps, is that pretty much finalized or is, do we it's have? It's just a, a single item. So okay. It's, uh, so how how do we do heap discovery in from just heap names? Do it, we standardize yeah, names? Just heap names. That's something we can discuss about. We can try and standardize that as part of uh, merging it in. So because I went through quote unquote standardizing ION recently, yeah. I found out a bunch of places where, for example, if for Android to depend on ION, uh, it needs to know exactly what heap is which. Today, the way it happens is because whoever is writing the kernel side ion code and the user space side, they just know which heap ID to use, yeah. and they just use that. So if unless there is some standardization, for example, the CMA heaps, how do I know which CMA range to use, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so. I mean, the, the problem is, is that this is the way ion is fundamentally, <laughs> this is the way ion is fundamentally designed to work, is that ion is fundamentally designed so that user space is making the decision to be do the heap allocation, so that user space has to have some sort of a priori knowledge about how ex where exactly things are going to go to. So I mean, I, I, I don't think we can get away from um, having some user space have some knowledge of that. I'm not sure if that's what. Yeah, in, in ION, for sure, we can do that. But I'm just hoping we do it for the DMA buff heaps. Yeah. So there is, the, the, the discoverability covers the case where we don't have to, uh, there'll be custom heap implementation and whatnot, but the, we, we can literally say, oh, this is the only way user space discovers heaps, and this is how you get their information, you can't just pre-negotiate what a heap looks like. Like for example, if the heap nodes are being named, I can call them like DMA buff heap foo, and only somehow, somewhere, just you opens the DMA buff heap foo, and that's bad. Yeah. So yeah. we wanted to see if we can somehow So as part of the current, uh, uh, current offering of solution, it's only the enumeration of, uh, enumeration is done only by names, because each heap is the, its own car dev. Uh, but we can, I think, uh, trying to figure out a discovery mechanism based on some properties that might be something we can talk about. You said that you're hoping the vendors would all switch over to DMA buff. Is there any plans DMA to ever? DMA buff heaps? Yes. Yeah. Is there any plans to ever deprecate ION? Good question. Uh, Good question. When, uh, when DMA buff heap goes upstream, yes. Uh, we still have to, when it becomes an upstream thing, we still have to carry ION for at least another year by the time everything catches up. So yeah, that's basically the plan. Yeah, that, that is the idea. So that's the whole idea around doing destaging of ION <coughs> using DMA buffs and say well, bye bye to ION. The, the biggest obstacle I see for the DMA, we can figure out the user space API and whatnot, the big thing is the cache management. So that's the biggest thing yes. that I know of where people don't want to switch to DMA buff even they want the cache chain or uh, the partial yeah, flushes and so ranges uh, and whatnot. Sure. Okay. 
That's not bad. I, I was not sure I'll be able to finish. Um, hi, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I want to just give a quick talk to update folks on DRM KMS in, in AOSP and kind of how we're trying to push the push the, the platform forward and push testing forward with DRM. Um, so uh, Pixel 3a, Pixel 3a uh, XL came out this year, same driver as Pixel 3. Um, that's in AOSP, it's using DRM, D D atomic mode setting driver. Uh, Dragonboard 845C is currently under review, it's going to be added to AOSP shortly. It's the same SOC as Pixel 3, that was the, the demo that uh, Tom and Sumit showed, uh, it running on Pixel 3. But it's, unfortunately, it's not the same driver. It's the, the upstream MSM DRM driver, not the Snapdragon Display Engine driver, which is used on Pixel 3. But it does prove that Android can run on a DRM, uh, atomic mode setting DRM KMS driver, which is, you know, we, we knew that, but it's a good demonstrator in AOSP for, for, for other, other SOC manufacturers. Um, also, another thing, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, Cuttlefish is now using Vertio GPU, which is aligning our virtual platform to use DRM atomic mode setting driver. Um, we had to backport the 5.3 RC4 version of Vertio GPU to 4.14 and 4.19, but in out support EDID, and we still have some issues with the default FB format, the framework for format, as I mentioned in my previous presentation. Um, but for the most part, it works, and uh, we, we're, we're fully going to pile on that rather than our old GPU architecture. Um, so just to kind of give a status update on upstreaming. Um, the only boards I can show are externally available boards visible in AOSP, um, but it does show that there's been no change on Pixel because Pixel 3 was the same as Pixel 3, Pixel 3a was the same as Pixel 3, but um, you know that might change uh, with future products. Um, Highkey um, kind of demonstrates that uh, it's possible to to do an out-of-tree Android compatible <coughs> DRM multi-planar DRM driver outside of. Uh, outside of um, upstream uh, without making upstream changes. So in their 419 kernel, you can see there's no changes in the DRM core, but th there are only a small number of changes even back to 414, which are mostly just backports. Um, but these drivers are still, you know, in the case of high key, ten, about 10,000 lines long. Um, when we look at X15, which is an OMAP platform, that's also about 10 to 20,000 lines. Um, but again, it doesn't require many changes to DRM core. So I think we, we, can, sh we can demonstrate that you know, d upstream DRM is, it, it, it is able to, uh, to, to suit the needs of Android. It has got to the point where you know, there aren't features that we need to add to it per se um, that are required by, by conformance. But for Android, kind of bare minimum, it, it's, it's enough. Um, and then looking at Dragon Board, obviously, because that's being developed essentially in uh, upstream, um, again, that's a, a very minor delta from the upstream driver. It's, again, it's probably just, ch it, well, in this case, it's, uh, it's actually not cherry picks. These are, just, these are changes that have not yet been uh, accepted upstream, but just a small number of changes. So, you know, honestly, everybody involved in these projects has done an amazing job of uh, aligning to upstream and making sure that those upstream changes come back to the Android co common kernel trees and derivatives of those, and uh, it is actually looking good. Um, so again, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, uh, Cuttlefish is now a platform that for the Android Common Kernel and GKI, uh, we are kind of uh, DRM, using it as a, as a as demonstration vehicle for DRM. So it's possible to launch Cuttlefish with the DRM backend. Um, it works with uh, CrossVM on both Chrome OS and Linux, and the CrossVM built into Chrome OS, the one that ships with the current update channel, is enough to run Cuttlefish. You don't need a custom build of it. Um, and we are going to, re uh, to, to your question, Kareem, from before, we are adding a QMU support back because we know that the community also needs access to QMU support. It's just, uh, was temporarily deprioritized. But we do intend to support our DRM virtual stack on QMU as well. Um, so kind of, just kind of discussing the, the need for this in the Android Common Kernel. Um, so obviously partners merge from the Android Common Kernel. Um, and so we need to be careful with what we put in the Android Common Kernel. Now this is more important than ever with GKI, because if we choose to put DRM, the DRM core in the GKI, and I think the current plan is that we will do that, then w we do depend on 
that core being the same for everybody. Um, so somebody releasing a device with a GKI based on 4.19 or 5.4 will have a specific version of DRM core. Now, this doesn't seem like a big deal. Most kernel subsystems, it's not. But with DRM specifically, our kind of experience with the partner ecosystem with, with uh, GPU and display drivers from different manufacturers is that it's everybody is cherry picking and back porting and forward porting different versions of DRM to different kernel versions to support the customer their customers. So the actual if you look at the if you look at shipping devices that aren't those ASP, AOSP devices I highlighted earlier, it is a bit of a mess. Um, so we really need to know what kind of which version of DRM KMS would do people want to see in the Android Common kernel. And I think our current view on this is that it should be the latest that we can deliver, which will be kind of our in, in, the, in the case of Android R, potentially 5.4 uh, LTS. Um, so Cuttlefish is the only reference that we have building out of the, of the Android common kernel, but I hope that we will be able to add more boards uh, over time, especially as more things get mainlined. Um, and obviously, the reason for all doing all this is the greater alignment of, of the GPU and display stack upstream. Um, so just a brief update on testing as well. Um, so I talked about this last year. Uh, we, are, we now have successfully enabled DRM Harbor Composer on all, basically all the AOSP platforms. And moving forwards, that's what we will continue to do. Um, so we have alignment of a Harbor Composer, which kind of gives us an opportunity to do interesting things on the Harbor Composer side. Um, IGT GPU tools was added to AOSP, and I have started work on the build system changes. Um, there's more we need to do there to actually get more of the modules building. But it does, there, there is kind of fun basic support. Um, once that's in place, we'll we'll set a baseline. As Tom mentioned, that you know the the the, the tool itself is not terribly aligned to S the needs of SOC platforms. It's not it's not a particularly wide ranging test uh, case of tests at the moment. But we can once we've enabled it as a baseline, I think it will give us a center of point to actually base other test efforts on. Um, and my idea is obviously that if a DRM driver is detected, it will automatically run this baseline of tests uh, using IGT GPU tools, probably in VTS. Um, and then we'll incrementally increase the test coverage over Android releases. Um, any questions? Uh, we did have a long discussion about this already. So, so I'm from the Android display team, and we own Hardware Composer, and we've been talking about <coughs> completely blowing it up in the future and turning it into a couple of small idle interfaces. And we'd manage the core of it. We were hoping someday to be able to talk to DRM KMS or through libdrm um, without needing to know any vendor specific information. Right. Do you see that as being possible? Um, well, I've, I, I learned recently that the uh, d even the DRM ioctal function can be overridden upstream. So that does present some problems. Um, but I think, I think one of the things that actually Daniel suggested to me was that Android could take steps that maybe were beyond what Upstream does, which is we could actually you know, hack the kernel basically to, to disallow overriding, say, DRM ioctal, and then make sure that a, spet, a set of you know, Upstream approved behavior and Upstream approved ioctals exist, namely the ioctals that would be required for kind of a baseline hardware composer. But we also obviously need to provide an extension mechanism because not everybody implements display hardware the same way. And so there needs to be a way of doing value add. But I think, I think in, in general, if we do this kind of alignment, um, we can uh, eliminate something like the Harbor Composer Howl and actually have our services talking to DRM directly. That would be the goal, in my opinion. I think that's pretty lofty. I think we could probably get mostly there, but you do need some knowledge about what's underneath the kernel interface. Yes. Um, for example, some of the restrictions, like the one that's particularly nasty is that Rockchip only supports AFBC on one plane, but it can be any of its planes. And it's something that you really just have to know because uh, it's kind of hard to, f to codify that. To give a bit more context for our plan, we had been discussing having a, a solver idle interface it's basically the intelligence of Hardware Composer. It's the thing that really people care to write, and they don't care about the rest of the code. A solver would say, 
I want to send these layers to the GPU. I want to send these layers to my mem to mem unit. And that would be a separate Heidel, separate Heidel interface. And then I want to send these ones to DRM KMS. And you'd specify what plane and some of the information to program it. Yeah, that's basically what you need. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's something that's achievable. But what we would do, I mean, once we have the planner as well in place, or the solver, sorry, you would be able to test that as well. But I'll, I would quite like to have both kinds of tests, low-level tests via something like IGT GPU tools, and then maybe kind of Android tests that would be testing things above that layer. I'd like both to work. You guys could uh, play with this already by uh, contributing to DRM Hardware Composer. Yes. <laughs> yes. When we've talked about prototyping it, we always discuss starting with DRM Hardware Composer and then breaking it up. We do it in open source. and. So just to put, so this, Sean, this news is kind of like hot off the press for us. We have only just enabled DRM Harbor Composer in Cuttlefish. So it is my intention to contribute to that project and oh, upstream to DRM. So you're using DRM Hardware Composer and Cuttlefish on Linux or? On Android. No, but uh, on CrossVM on Linux or? Uh, we don't, we. Or we sorry, you're using it. So we're using it in our guest. Okay, you're not using it. Sorry, I thought you were using the Wayland thing on. Uh, we don't Chrome use OS. the. We don't use the uh, legacy. Okay. okay. Yeah, we, we don't use the the legacy uh, the Wayland interface. We're using. We're tracking the upstream mechanism on the. What's it? The, DM, the DMA buff mechanism. Whenever they've added to cross VM now, we're not using Verte or Wayland. Cool. Yeah. That's why. Uh, uh, we we needed the the functionality we discussed in my last talk about uh, multiplanar. That IO GPU, because we actually want to run this stuff in the guest, not on the host. Yep. Oh, I just wanted to understand. So, how did we decide we are going to standardize things again for the solver, or we decided we are not going to standardize things for solver? Uh, no. Question. Well, I, I think the, the point Sean was making was that constraint constraint management, essentially, is not something you can handle with like an, or it's not something you would efficiently handle with an IOCTL interface. It would be too custom. So the, the, the idea is the way it works in DRAM and mode with, it, with atomic mode setting is you set a configuration, and if it's, allowed to, if it's not allowed to set it, you'll, it'll bounce you. And so you want to make sure when you do those calls that it, it's, it, the configuration's valid for all the planes, connectors, and everything else that's, that's configured on that device. So the vendor-specific <coughs> horribleness goes in both the display driver and the user space, but not in the interface between those components. But we still need to standardize the user space, the IOCTL interface, yeah. for example. Yeah. And some minimum things that we expect to exist at some point in time. Yeah. Um, I think the, so the, the problem is the, the KMS <coughs> interface to set up a scene, for example, to put your buffers on planes, uh, you need to have some knowledge of the hardware to make yeah. an intelligent choice about what to try. And then you can right. try that, and the kernel will tell you, nope. yes, that will work, or no, it won't work. But you need some smarts to know where to start and also how to fall <coughs> back. Right. Because otherwise, you'll just try the best thing the kernel will say no for some reason you don't know, and then you'll fall back to GPU compositing. But, but doesn't it rely on, like, for example, if majority of the hardware that we deal with always supports, like, say, two overlays and two planes, can't we just say, oh, we need, we have a test which basically expects this particular thing setting to succeed on no. any hardware? No. Because not all Android hardware does have such hardware capabilities. Well, yeah, obviously, that was the first question. Right. If it doesn't, then you, so, yeah, you just can't rely on that ever being true because of a myriad of things. Yeah, and an example, another example of this is bandwidth management. So for example, displays and GPUs lot, use a lot of memory bandwidth. If the device is operating in a low power mode, it may not be able to do as many things as it was able to do when it had lots of bandwidth available. So a configuration that might have been successfully settable previously is no longer settable. And whether DRM should have, or whether we should standardize DRM chain, uh, in such a way that you could requery all of that kind of stuff is, it seems out of the scope, out of scope for DRM core. Another complication that we probably will never be able to standardize is some Android vendors will take over their display controller and use it for other subsystems temporarily. as like a mem to mem unit to do format conversions, color corrections, stuff like that. And that just doesn't belong in DRM core. What do y'all think? Blitters? 
color space converters, do they, should they be exposed as video devices in DRAM? So we have write back devices right now, which is kind of in that range of things, but no, probably not. I think those sound like deeper L devices. Daniel's got nothing to say. <laughs> there has been some suggestions made that maybe V4L should be merged into DRM at some point. Uh, that's, it's not a power grab, it's my nightmare, but yeah. <laughs> Right. Um. Hello again. Uh, so this presentation is about util clamp. Um, this is a new facility in the kernel, uh, which was developed by ARM. Actually, Patrick Bilashi is here as a main developer. And um, I'll be talking about our plans to use it in the Android and replace uh, Sketch soon. Um, proprietary uh, C group, basically. So the basic idea of uh, boosting and clamping tasks is uh, you basically change the utilization of the task to, uh, for it to look uh, bigger or smaller to the scheduler. <coughs> and that will affect the frequency selection and also the task placement uh, when uh, sketch it yields uh, uh, governor and ES uh, are, uh, are being used in the system just like uh, in Android. So here's a comparison between Sketchtune and UtilClamp. Obviously, Sketchtune is out of tree custom C group controller. It supports only V1, C groups V1, and uh, only limited number of um, task groups. Uh, its uh, boosting is nonlinear, so it's difficult to tune. Um, and um, it has some, some additional uh, features which are kind of hard-coded, so they are not very flexible. And uh, UtilClamp, on the other hand, is uh, upstream as of 5.3. Cgroup support will most likely go into 5.4, 5 and it supports um, both Cgroup V1 and V2. Uh, in addition, it supports per task uh, syscalls and also system-wide defaults, which are missing in uh, Sketchtune. Um, its thresholding is uh, simple, it's linear, and uh, we are actually, the features which, which are missing are uh, boost holding and um, uh, preferential features, um, but they are uh, being worked on. So here are some results uh, running the uh, Android uh, Junk Bench um, tests and the power performance numbers look pretty good. They are very comparable. There is one case uh, which is shown in red where we see regression and we are um, going to be looking at it. But overall it looks pretty comparable so we don't uh, expect any regressions by switching to util clamp. Um, so our rollout plan is basically next version of Android. Um, it will be upstream in uh, kernel 5.4, and we are planning to backboard most likely up to 4.19. Um, there are several considerations which we still need to clarify, whether we are going to use uh, Cgroup V1 or V2, unified hierarchy, or um, which that will be driven by that Cgroup V1 or V2. This, um, uh, consideration and also per role or per application task grouping. And uh, there is a number of things which still need to work through. Um, as I said, there is a number of features which are missing. Uh, one of them is boost hold feature, um, uh, which basically keeps the boosting um, for, for some specific uh, time. Um, that's missing in util clamp and uh, prefer idle, which we would like to discuss today. Uh, the couple of options to implement it, and there are a number of things which we need to validate. Um, one of them is our, uh, the requirement for our, uh, all RT tasks to be in the uh, root C group, where we don't know if there are any um, negative effects of that yet, 
And also <coughs> the fact that we are using CPU controller means uh, the bandwidth, CPU bandwidth will be divided between the C groups. Um, and we also need to valid, uh, evaluate the possible negative effects of that. Um, before I go to discussion points, I'll talk about migration process for us. So we have prototype working and migration was pretty straightforward. Basically we needed to change the uh, um, task profiles to use util clamp instead of sketch zoom controller. Uh, there are small changes in the power how to uh, use something, uh, instead of preferidal, some new mechanisms, which we will be discussing today. And um, there are a number of changes in the init scripts to basically not mount sketch tune controller and instead use CPU controller and create appropriate hierarchy under it. Um, so, and discussion points that we would like to discuss today is a prefer idle replacement. And two options that we see right now is, one is to use a um, couple of conditions uh, to replace prefer idle hint. So instead of, and the second op option is basically uh, introducing a new property. Um, the first option would be um, if task is boosted and if uh, it has shares higher than default ones, considers that um, a hint that prefer idle should be enabled. And prefer idle means uh, we want uh, to place that task on a CPU which is uh, idle right now. Uh, that helps with uh, reducing the latency. So uh, right now it's used for um, touch boost, which is basically when user, um, um, there's a touch event we want the latencies to be mi minimized for such a task so that the, the response time is very short. It's, it's um, also used for all top app. So the apps that are part of the user okay. experience right now, we're optimizing for latency so they don't miss their their vSync windows. I see, okay. Um, so basically we are, we are trying to optimize it for the latency. And um, so, <coughs> If we go with this option, we don't need to add any additional uh, proper, uh, properties into CPU controller. The second option is to add um, just additional CPU um, controller property, which would say um, whether the task is latency tolerant or not. And by default, um, all tasks are um, basically latency tolerant unless we set it to false, in which case, uh, it will be similar to setting prefer idle to true. So uh, the scheduler will try to find uh, an idle CPU for that task. Um, so those are two options that we, we are considering and uh, if anybody has any concerns about those or any preferences, we would, we would like to know about it rather earlier <laughs> in the process. This is the last presentation, so if we, if we end earlier. <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right, so if anybody has any suggestions or any concerns about these approaches, or if there are any questions. Hmm, I guess not. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.